בשם השם נעשה ונצליח. שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, everybody, thank you for coming for our big event, ברוך השם, lots of uh, amazing things uh, have been uh, prepared for you guys. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank all of the wonderful people that sent us משלוח uh, מנות, very uh, precious, very appreciated. Tonight's shiur will be uh, for the Lui Nishmat of the Sara uh, Torah, Rav Kanievsky, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, and also Lehavdil for a Refuah Shlema for Rabbanit Levan Abat Sara, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, Avi Mori David Ben Nesriya, Doris Bat Jora, and also for the Atzlachar Abba. For Marsha Bat Julie, Ayla Bat Marsha, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sefas Ben Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, Louis Ben Marsha, Shaul Ben Farzane, Amir Ben Shahin, and all of Am Israel and all of the righteous Noahais that continue to do everything possible to serve Akadosh Baruch Hu to the best of their abilities each and every day. So, uh, first of all, it's, uh, the, these events, Baruch Hashem, are a very big uh, undertaking and uh, it's always wonderful to see. Uh, you guys, but uh, also to see some new faces each time we have some new faces and also to uh, get the uh, the messages from some of you after the events uh, about the chizuk that you got uh, from the event, the blessings that came uh, were fulfilled. Uh, Baruch Hashem, today I got, or last night technically I guess, I got a message from somebody that came to the event uh, last uh, month uh, that a uh, 42-year-old woman that uh, never got married before, was scared to get married, and uh, Baruch Hashem uh, uh, got a bracha and found her uh, b'shert. Baruch Hashem found, uh, and uh, Bezat Hashem will be married very soon. It's uh, going that fast, it's going that good, and Baruch Hashem, when uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu, he is a blessing that he wants to fulfill, he doesn't need much time to fulfill it. So Baruch Hashem, now uh, we... Uh, Glad to always have more Torah in the world, but we all have to face the fact that we uh, are missing an enormous amount of Torah in the world today as a result of uh, Rav Kanievsky's passing. And uh, when somebody completes the, so much Torah each and every year, the entire Shas Bavli, the entire Shas Yerushalmi, the Zohar, the, the Midrashim, the Tanakh, the Shulchan Aruch, uh, and endless other uh, sfarim and, and uh, sidrot. Uh, when someone like that leaves the world, we, uh, we have to ask ourselves, what did he care about? Uh, what can we relate to? Someone sent me a message uh, earlier and said, uh, you know, I really can't relate to Rav Kanievsky. And uh, I said, perhaps maybe once you get married and get a little older, maybe you'll, uh, you'll relate. And he asked me why I asked this question, why I said this. And uh, typically it's because when you get married, you have uh, some more life experiences that you don't have when you're a single young man. Uh, and you'll be able to relate to things that uh, you don't see. But um, when we look at some of the stories about Rav Kanievsky, we, uh, we get to see things that all of us can relate to. Uh, that's beyond just uh, you know, all of the wonderful achievements that he made in, in, in completing the Torah an endless amount of times. Uh, and as Kadosh Baruch Hu showed how much he loved this Torah, that uh, each year he would complete all of these right before Pesach. But uh, on a Shana uh, Meuberet, like we have to, uh, this year, where there's two Adars, he would actually complete it on uh, Adar Bet, meaning a, a month earlier than uh, he typically would. Uh, and uh, what ended up happening is that the day after he completed it again, is when he left the world. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu restructured all of humanity in the entire world just to wait for Rav Kanievsky to complete all of these Sfarim, all of the Shas, the written and the oral Torah one more time uh, and right before he leaves, uh, he leaves us and uh, leaving us an orphan generation. But uh, now you have a lot of stories coming out about Rav Kanievsky, some that were known, uh, some that weren't known, and uh, people are really getting to start getting to know him as the person. And uh, one thing that uh, you'll notice from some of the videos and his stories is there's a couple of common denominators. Rav Kanievsky cared a lot about Judaism. And I don't mean necessarily just the religion and the Torah, but also the appearance. He cared that the Jews looked Jewish. And many times 
you see that when uh, rabbis, Talmidim, would come and visit him, he would uh, make a comment and uh, ask the, if the rabbi didn't have a beard, he'd ask him, where's the beard? If the, uh, if the uh, rabbi or the kids didn't have their peyot uh, uh, sticking out in the front and they had them, uh, like it's, uh, some have the tradition of putting it behind their back, uh, back of their ear, he would tell them, no, no, put it in the front. Put it in the front. And there was actually a story that just came out uh, where uh, the uh, well-known rabbi, Kiruv rabbi, that uh, went to uh, Rav Kanievsky, uh, telling him that he's having trouble for it with a young boy that uh, doesn't want to uh, learn and uh, is uh, uh, very problematic. And uh, instead of Rav Kanievsky telling him, listen, why don't you try teaching him this, maybe the boy is this, maybe the boy is that. Instead he told the rabbi, the well-known Kiruv rabbi, Tomit Chacham, Someone that cares about Am Yisrael. The only advice that he gave this rabbi is when the rabbi grows a beard, the kid's going to want to learn. Because this rabbi had the tradition that he wanted for years to be more relatable to people and therefore he chose not to wear a beard. And he says, I got the Musar of a lifetime. That all of these years, I'm trying to relate to the boys and in reality, the Torah says otherwise. The boys have to see someone that they could not necessarily relate to and connect to to their secular life, to the traditional life, but rather someone different, a figure from the Torah. And he says, and I chose to put on a beard after that, and the kid chose to learn. So we see that Rav Kanievsky cared a lot about how we look, what our appearance is, and uh, in, in, in so many videos and stories, you see this repeated time and time again. What didn't he care about? Well, there was one time, and I heard this from my Rav, who heard this from the person that actually was, is in the story. This one guy came uh, to Rav Kanievsky and uh, was asking him for a bracha. And uh, before he left, he uh, asked Rav Kanievsky, and this guy wasn't a uh, Talmit Chacham or anything, he asked Rav Kanievsky, what's the blessing on schnitzel? Schnitzel, what's the blessing on schnitzel? Now, if I ask Sunny, what's the blessing on schnitzel? Sunny's going to know. If I ask some of the young boys, what's the blessing on schnitzel? Most likely they're going to know. If I ask any of the girls here, they're going to know what the blessing on a schnitzel. But Rav Kanievsky didn't know what the blessing on a schnitzel was. You know what Rav Kanievsky asked him? What's a schnitzel? What's a schnitzel? So the guy was baffled. What, what, what do you mean, what's a schnitzel? You know, schnitzel, it's a chicken cutlet, and then you put it in some eggs, and then on top of it you put some, you know, maybe you want to put potato chips if you want it to be crunchy, or if you want to put maybe uh, some uh, flour, some uh, uh, breading, you know, schnitzel. Rav Kanievsky asked him, is the chicken big or small? If it's big, much bigger than, you know, the, the, uh, the breadcrumbs, then uh, you say shakol. But if it's small and the breadcrumbs are the, the, you know, significant part of it, then you have to say mezonot. So the guy got his answer, and on his way out, he saw Rabbanit Kanievsky shtichye, Allah shalom. She was a big tzadika, and... Um, he asked the Rabbanit, doesn't the Rav ever eat schnitzel? You know, it's a very common food in Israel, needless to say, in the world. The Rabbanit says, of course he eats schnitzel. I give him schnitzel once in a while. She says, but he didn't know what schnitzel is. She goes, oh, that's because the Rav, he doesn't ever ask what the food is. He just asked me, what's the bracha on this? That's what he cares about. He doesn't care what he's eating. He cares what's the blessing on it. The question is, what do we care about? Do we care about the food that we eat, the restaurants we dine in, the kind of car we drive, the type of clothes we wear to look like everybody else? Or do we care about things that are a little bit different than everybody else? And 
The topic I want to discuss tonight, I mean, we're talking about Yetziat Mitzrayim is about to happen all over again in Pesach, where the Ramchal says that our holidays are not like the holidays of the Goim. Our holidays are very different because the universe that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created gets to the same spiritual level each and every year at the same exact time. Meaning that the meritorious status that we got to, the high level of, of spirituality that we got to in Purim is repeated every year on Purim. And the same with Shavuot, and the same with Yom Kippur, and the same with Pesach, and everything else. The whole world changes at that time. So we are about to get to Yetziat Mitzrayim again. Pesach is only a few weeks away. It's important for people to learn Alachot Pesach now and not wait for a couple of days before Pesach to learn them or during Pesach to learn them because surely you're going to violate Pesach if you do that. Alachot Pesach are the most extensive in the entire uh, Torah. If you look at the uh, Shuchan Aruch, the biggest section in Shuchan Aruch is Alachot Pesach. Very extensive, lots of details. But everyone knows the story. Everyone knows that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, after putting us in Egypt for 210 years, of which Chachamim say 116 years of those 210 years were outright holocaust. We cry on a regular basis, both religious and secular Jews, Sephardic, Ashkenazi, Hasidic, we cry about the Holocaust. Everyone knows somebody that died in the Holocaust, or almost died in the Holocaust, or wanted to die in the Holocaust. Everyone knows people that have suffered from the Holocaust. But the reality is that what happened to us in Egypt was much more severe. Much, much more severe. The Holocaust was a few years. Egypt was 116 years. 116 years of destruction, 116 years of idolatry, 116 years of all of the worst possible things ever created. And then eventually HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends us our Goel, sends us Moshe Rabbeinu, that the Midrash says that if it wasn't for Moshe Rabbeinu, we would still be in Egypt till this day. Because nobody else was willing to do what Moshe Rabbeinu was willing to do. No one else was willing to die for Am Yisrael. So he sends us the Goel. He sends us our Mashiach. We leave Egypt. Several weeks later, we receive the Torah. We get to the highest spiritual level in the history of mankind. We receive the Torah, the culmination of the world. Where the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world, each and every single day he would add and put things in the right place. But on the sixth day, he made a vow. There was one day there's going to be a nation that will be gifted the Torah. The very same Torah that he used as a blueprint to create the world. The very same Torah that he wrote with black fire over white fire 974 generations before he created the world. And that very same Torah is the reason for why this world exists. And if that nation accepts this Torah, then they will see the following day, they will see Shabbat, the world will see Shabbat. But if not, the world will end. Hence the reason why the Midrash says that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu lifted the mountain on top of Am Yisrael at Mount Sinai and told them, if you accept the Torah, treat this mountain as if this is our chupa. We're getting married. If not, this will be your burial ground. So Chachamim asked in the Gemara, what kind of choice is this? Is this really, do we really accept the Torah free choice? Sure it was free. It was just very expensive to say no. 
So how could this be free choice? So Chamim say, what do you think we have? An irresponsible God that's going to leave the existence of the world in the hands of people? He had to give them a clarity of what's on the line. The question is, why did we merit to get this Torah? Everyone has heard and most likely remembers that we had three merits. Our forefathers were idolaters. No different than the Egyptians. With the exception of the Levi tribe, everyone else was worshipping idols like the Egyptians. Hence the reason why we, when we got to Yam Suf, the angel of the ocean did not want to split the ocean. He said to Hashem, why should I split the ocean and then drown the Egyptians if they're worshipping idols and they're worshipping idols? So what merit did we have to go from being idolaters where even the ocean did not want to split for us to getting to the culmination of the world, the highest level of Kedusha? Three things. Shmam, Sfatam velevusham. Their names, their tongue, meaning their language, and their clothes. Those are the three merits we had. Surely there was a promise made to Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. But that promise made us candidates, made us someone that could be. There was no guarantee. We had to have merits. And those merits were that we continued to call our children Jewish names, continued calling the kids Yosef and Yaakov and Moshe and Levi and Yitzchak. We didn't call our kids Wilbur and all types of other uh, foreign names. We didn't call our kids like. We didn't call our kids TikTok. We called our kids Jewish names. And that was worth a lot for Hashem. We continued speaking Hebrew, Sfat Kodesh, the same language that Kadosh Baruch Hu created the world in. We didn't make English, Spanish, Portuguese, Egyptian our priority our primary, our mother tongue. Hebrew was still our mother tongue. And that was also worth a lot for Hashem. But then he said we kept our clothes. That's kind of confusing. What was all wrong with the Egyptian clothes? I mean, you can't compare it to the clothes of today. Today's clothes is not clothes. Today people walk around with what the, my grandparents called underwear. So you can't really say today's clothes is clothes. A normal parent wouldn't even let their kids shower in such clothes. But unfortunately today the parents are walking around like that. But even when you don't put the immodesty as one of the main things, even if you just look at the style of clothes. The style of clothes of today is unfortunately very feminine, very disgusting. But, you see, even Yeshiva Bachurim wanting to look like the celebrities, wanting to wear tight jeans, like one of these rappers, wanting to wear tight shirts, like some filthy designer decided to make, wanting to wear hats, why don't I make the keeper so small you could barely identify it? One guy sent me a picture that in his town they've taken the guy's hair and turned it into a keeper. And that way you can't tell he's wearing a keeper. They're claiming it's for protection against anti Semitism. You can sell that to somebody that doesn't have a brain. But nonetheless, you have a lot of people wanting to wear this clothes today. But in the past, 
We wore Jewish clothes. Kadosh Baruch Hu thought it was a big deal. Such a big deal that if we would have worn Egyptian clothes, we would still be in Egypt today. Now let me ask you a question. When you really think about it, does that really make that much sense to you? If I told you that clothes, if you wear the clothes of the goyim, you are considered an infidel. Not much less than Manus and, and, and Ephraim and the rest of the Rishayim out there. Does that make sense to you? If I told you that if you wear these tight jeans and tight pants and Imada's clothes, you're not much different than the heretics. Does that make sense to you? If I told you that you would still be in Egypt because you decided to wear a really, really tight shirt and tight pants and maybe a little rip on the side, but it's very expensive. I mean, each pants, five, six, seven hundred dollars. The so-called mother's clothes, classic clothes, uh, you can get a Walmart for 30. I have a fashionable clothes, Rabbi. My t-shirt is 300 dollars. How could you say this is not good? How could you say I would still be in Egypt with a $400 t-shirt, $18,000 watch, and shoes that uh, only dancers wear. The loafers that uh, are so tight you forget the guy has a foot, it looks like a finger. But I paid $900 for them, Rabbi. How could you say I would still be in Egypt? How could you say such things that I'm an infidel because I wear these clothes? Let's see if we could find ourselves a friend that can get us to perhaps understand that we're wrong about having such a thought. Maybe it's not really such a big deal. Maybe it was a one-time exception that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, listen, the Egyptian clothes was an exception. They had all types of weird things on their neck and their arms. And they look like, you know, the movies where they, they, they all look like they just came out of some, uh, you know, uh, pyramid. People wore these strange hats. They look like dragons. Maybe, yeah, that's, that's an exception. But today, looking like little Wayne, 50 Cent, and uh, perhaps, I don't know, one of these other uh, Amalekim over there, it's no big deal. Stop it's not the same thing, Rabbi. It was a one-time exception 3,000 years ago. Don't go crazy. Maybe we're wrong. But what if we're right? That means that we can't leave Egypt. Even if now is the time. That you can scream Mashiach now until you're blue in the face. He's not coming. Why? We don't have the merit. Our tight jeans, our tank tops are holding us back. Can such a thing be? Does that make any sense whatsoever? Can my clothes really define me and say I'm Jewish because I wear normal, or what used to be normal at least, mother's clothes versus a guy that may be learning five hours a day but he likes to wear $900 shoes, $15,000 suits, but he looks like, uh, I don't know, he just came out of a runway. Can that guy in the yeshiva be holding me back from Mashiach? Is that possible? And if he did come, the guy that's in the yeshiva would not actually be saved? While the guy that's out there plumbing but he does mitzvot, he keeps Shabbat, he protects his eyes, protects his bleed, makes time to learn Torah, maybe an hour, two hours a day. He doesn't learn 5, 10, 20 hours a day. He works, provides for his family, gives some tzedakah. That guy is going to be saved, the plumber. But the so-called rabbi that's stylish, drives a Tesla. And comes out like he just came out of some action movie. He's not coming out. He's getting destroyed with the goyim. Is there such a reality that's in our mind right now? Does anybody actually buy this? That the guy that's learning, the guy that's teaching, but because he wears these clothes, he's not getting saved. 
With a show of hands, how many of you actually think this is even possible? That the guy that's learning, teaching everything good, but he's wearing eh, stylish clothes, $20,000 an outfit. He's not getting saved by Mashiach. In fact, he's delaying the Mashiach. How many of you actually believe that's a reality? Baruch Hashem, you're all honest. Only a handful of you actually raised your hand. But let's see if you're right. Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin wanted to teach us what it means to be a Jew. The Gaumi Vilna left him a wealth of Torah, so much so that it sparked his extraordinary neshama to get to such a high level that the entire world of yeshivot was built as a result of Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin. In his sefer, Nefesh Chaim, chapter 4, section 13, or gate 4, section 13, and on. He talks about the significance of learning Torah. So much so that he brings Shuchan Aruch, Zohar, Gemara, and countless other places to tell us that any Jew that does not learn Torah on a regular basis, meaning daily, has no share of the world to come. Where he's going to go to Gehenom even after Mashiach comes. Until forever. Meaning, a guy that does not learn Torah is in the same caliber as a Mechalel Shabbat. Same caliber as someone that we see it on purpose. Same caliber as some of the heretics out there. Not that he didn't learn Torah because he was, I don't know, in prison in, in Nigeria somewhere and he could, didn't give him any books. He had the opportunity to learn Torah. Simply chose to watch sports instead. He chose to uh, hang out with his friends. He chose to do a lot of other things. Learning Torah was never really his thing. But he gave tzedakah. He uh, kept Shabbat. Rabbi Chaim Yivolozhin says he has no share of the world to come. So already we see that the image of a Jew, according to the giants, the Rav Kanievskis of the world, the Rabbi Chaim Yivolozhin of the world, the ones that knew the Torah, is very, very different than what your typical Jew thinks. Because just if you tell people, if you don't learn Torah, you have no heaven, that already throws a lot of people off the bus. In Psalm number 50, verse number 23, David the Melech teaches us something interesting. He says, he offers confession, he offers confession honors me, he who offers confession honors me, and one who orders his way, I will show him the salvation of God. This is talking about the korban that a person gives if he saw a miracle, not a korban as a result of sinning. There's a special korban, korban toda, where you say special thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for saving you from something, for making a miracle. Anyone that's had a miracle, it's very important to have today a seudat odaya, a... a a thanksgiving uh, uh, meal that's given to Avrechim, to Talmidei uh, Chachamim, to have a feast, to have a shield Torah, to publicize the miracle to as many people as possible. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that from this verse, in the Midrash Rabbah, Parashat Tzav, this week's, uh, last week's parasha, in uh, Siman Tet, Perikbet. What is the meaning of this verse? What is the meaning of this verse where it says, not just he honors me, where it would typically say yechabdeni, but it says yechabdeneni, where which means he honor upon honor, honor on top of honor. So the midrash says. From there we learn that anyone who honors a Kadosh Baruch Hu, 
sanctifies his name, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give him the reward of giving him an opportunity to sanctify his name again. And everyone knows there's no greater thing than honoring HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name, so much so that the Gemara says that if you live through the day and you didn't honor Hashem, it was better off you weren't born. Yeah, but what if I honored him for the last 30 years, every single day, and today, I don't know, I forgot. Gemara says, it was better you weren't born. Why? You failed your mission. But if you did honor him, David the Medech says, if you honored him, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give you the opportunity to honor him again. Sanctify his name. Rabbi Yosef Karo, the Baal Shulchan Aruch, his whole life prayed, prayed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he kills him on Kiddush Hashem. What's dying on Kiddush Hashem? That a bunch of goyim will murder him just because he's a Jew. The whole, his whole life he prayed for this. People today pray for a Tesla, a new house, a second house, a fifth vacation, all types of stuff. Rabbi Yosef Karo prayed to die in Kiddush Hashem. Like Rabbi Akiva that got killed in the most vicious, horrific way humanly known. Where after they peeled his skin, they sold his meat in the market. Rabbi Yosef Karo prayed for this. Now who knows more? You are Rabbi Yosef Kawa. Rabbi Yosef Kawa. So apparently there's something to it about honoring HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name. There's something to it, especially when you look at it from the perspective of a Jew that knows that this life is a life of work, of toil, in order for you to live for eternity. This is just a stop. It's just a stop. People call this life. In reality, it's just a stop as part of life to decide where the rest of life will be. So when someone looks at this life as everything, then of course they're not going to want that. When someone looks at this life as a place to toil, to earn a better place for eternity, then perhaps they could understand at least why Rabbi Yosef Karo wanted it. Now again, we don't necessarily pray for such things. We're not at that level. But nonetheless, we can understand the mind of Tzadikim. Why they learn Torah like Rav Kanievsky. Why they feel that there is no other way but to study Torah 24 hours a day. And since it's not possible by a single human being, then Rabbi, Rabbi Chaimi Voloshin designed his yeshiva to have 24 hours a day of Torah by having shifts. Just like corporate America has shifts, the oil companies have shifts, the Coca-Cola companies have shifts, the Microsofts have shifts where 24 hours a day somebody's working to make sure the network continues to go, to make sure the factory continues to go, the cans continue to be made, the phones continue to be made 24 hours a day, the potato chips keep being made. Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin wasn't looking for potato chips. He was looking for Torah 24 hours a day, and therefore he had shifts. You study from this hour to that hour. You study from this hour to that hour. In the yeshiva. Why? Maybe, maybe, nobody else in the world is studying Torah. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu told us, that if even for a second somebody is not learning Torah in the world, the world will simply cease to exist instantly, no warning. So he designed his yeshiva to have 24 hours a day Torah. So the mind of this Jew is a little bit different than the average Jew, let's just say. Now, the Midrash says, to honor HaKadosh Baruch Hu is such a big deal that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if you honored me, I'll allow you to honor me again. Further, the Midrash says that whoever honors me in this world will honor me in the next world. Meaning they'll have Olam Abba. The Gemara Masechet Moed Katan, page 5a, in the name of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, that's one of the ten people that entered Gan Eden alive. And he's also one of the greatest sources of what we have in Gehenom prepared for the Rishayim. Because he also entered Gehenom alive. And he came out. The Rashid Chokhmah has a whole section about Gehenom. Which is the actual story of what Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi was shown by the Malach HaMavit. Hey, this is the Tzis chamber. So he asked him, okay, so why are these people suffering this way? And the Malach Amavid explains them, they were friends. And they go to the next chamber, oh, why are they suffering that way? Oh, because da 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 da, he explained them, like, you know, like a shiur Torah. 
He also gave the same shiur Torah to Isaiah, the prophet. But this Rabbi Yashua ben Levi says, what is this yechabdeneni, this honor upon honor? What's the deeper lesson here? How do you honor Hashem? Daily cheshbon nefesh. Daily self-accounting of your actions. Did you do good? Did you do bad? You make sins? Did you do tshuva? Did you say thank you to your wife for cooking? Or you just expect her to cook just because you think she's your servant? Did you kiss your wife's hand? Tell her thank you for giving me kids? Or you say, oh honey, I think you're, uh, you've gained some weight. Of course you chamor she gained weight. She had kids. You just had cheeseburgers. Did you thank her? Did you tell her she's more beautiful and there's more to love? Or you're looking at some zona in the street thinking that you can get her instead? Did you thank your husband for paying the bills? Or you figured that he just works for you so he just pays the bills as part of his job? Did you thank your husband for learning Torah? Because that's the only way you're going to Olam Abba. Yeah, but I learned Torah, Rabbi. Good for you. But you're not going to Olam Abba if you learn Torah and your husband's an Am Haaretz. If your kids don't know Aleph Bet and your kids don't know Shema Israel, you can learn Torah and have an entire Facebook page publicizing all of the Torah that you know. You're still going again home. Why? It's not your job to be a Talmidah Chachama. Your job is to raise Talmidah Chachamim. Your husband, your kids. Yeah, but Rabbi, I heard that a woman is allowed to read the Megillah and even a Sefer Torah. Why can't I do it? Well, you can. It's just that Rabbi Yosef Karo and the rest of the Poskim say that any man that listens to you read the Megillah or the Torah that you're allowed to read is going to be cursed by heaven. What do you mean? But it's allowed. Exactly, it's allowed. It's allowed to get cursed by heaven. There's a thing to do and there's a thing to do. Some things there are to do. You're allowed, but you shouldn't. Some things there are to do. You're allowed and you should. Honoring Hashem, allowed and you should. And it's much easier than you can imagine. You don't have to die like Rabbi Yosef Karo wanted to die. Rabbi Yosef ben Levi says, simple. If you evaluate your actions every day, you're already honoring Hashem. The Ramchal, who's the Baal uh, Meslat Yesharim, famous Sefer, one of the biggest Musar works out there in the world. In his Sefer, Derech Etz Chaim, different than Mesilat Yesharim. He writes, in regards to the same verse, in regards to the same saying, that daily cheshbon nefesh, daily self-accounting, what is it really? It's asking why you even came to the world. Why did Kadosh Baruch even put you here? But not like some people do it where they're like depressed. Oh, why did God put me here, Rabbi? I'm so depressed, he left me. Yeah, well, he put you here not to sin, and you're crying because you sinned, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu is, has nothing to do with it. You sinned with a guy, you sinned with a girl, and now you're crying because they left you, they broke your heart, they found some, something else to replace you, a new battery? What, what's, what, what does that have to do with Hashem? Who said Hashem allowed you to do such a thing? Rabbi, I'm a Noahide. Am I allowed to have another woman because my wife doesn't want to be with me as often as I want to be? You can go in a zoo also. The lion, chimpanzee. Sure, by all means. Go over there. No, but Rabbi, they said that we're Noahide, so we're allowed to, you know, change and there's no marriage. Yeah, sure, you're allowed and there's no marriage. But you are married, first of all. And second of all, who says that you have to uh, fulfill every disgusting physical desire you have and simply disrespect the wife that gave you kids? What, just because you're a Gentile, that means you could be a beast? No, but 
she says it's okay. Yeah, she says it's okay right before she puts the poison in your, in your drink. It's perfectly fine, honey. Go, go. I'll even hook you up. Come, come, drink this before you go. I made it specially for you. It's cherry flavor. Allowed, but not recommended. Not allowed. Only delusional things that people are allowed. But nonetheless, people will try to take the Torah and manipulate like putty just to justify their sins. So the Ramchal says that Cheshbon Nefesh is first and foremost asking why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu put you here? What is your purpose in the world? Not what desire you want to fulfill and how much you want to accumulate before you go into a uh, six foot box. What are you here for? What are you supposed to do? Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the creator of all creations, the master of everything, why did he even think about you? Why does he give you air in your lungs? For what? For you to go and tell people about how much you like basketball? And how you know all the stats and the salary caps of every team? Oh, Rabbi, I know all the names of all the players. And there's a certain chamber for you too. Why, it's a sin? A hundred percent it's a sin. What kind of sin? Idol worship. Tell me the names of at least ten Rishonim. What's a Rishon, Rabbi? For sure, Rabbi. For sure, you, for sure, Rabbi. I don't know. For sure you're going to gain them. You know the, the entire team, but you don't know Rishonim? Why'd you come to the world? First question, Ramchal says. What did our forefathers and early sages do to earn themselves the position that they got? What am I doing in comparison? The Ramchal says this is what a person should do for an hour a day. Think, why am I here? What am I supposed to do? How could I do it? Now most people tell you, Rabbi, I don't have such time. You're a liar. Everybody has the same amount of time. Just people choose differently. Someone came to Rabbi Ephraim and told him, listen, Rabbi, I don't know how much I can learn, but you're telling me that I have to learn all these hours. Where can I fit it? He says, let's see, how many hours a day do you sleep? He says, six. I said, okay, let's say you sleep eight. He goes, no, but Rabbi, I sleep six. He goes, yeah, but just in case, let's say you sleep eight. Okay. How many, what do you do with the rest of your time? I mean, we all have 24 hours. 24 minus 8 equals 16. So you have 16 hours left. What do you do with the other 16 hours? He says, I work, Rabbi. Oh, you work. You know, other people in the world also work. You're not the only employee in the world. Other people, how many hours do you work? I work 8 hours. Okay, so now you have 8 and 8, 16. You're left with 8. What do you do with the other eight? He goes, oh, stuff. Okay, so let's say, how much stuff do you have? You have to go pray, right? You're a religious guy. So let's say you pray, you're, I don't know, you're like a uh, Rav Kook from Tveria. You pray three hours a day. You have five left. Let's say you need an hour simply to waste. Everybody needs a little shtuyot in their life. An hour to waste. You already slept, you already worked. An hour to waste, whatever it is that you waste your hour on. Hopefully it's not sins. You're left with four. Study four hours a day. Study four hours a day. I don't know, Rabbi. Let's do the calculation again. Okay. Eight and eight. It's not going to change. You don't see it as possible because you don't want it to be possible. Because you rather do other things. And unfortunately, in today's generation, I even have young kids, Bachurei Yeshivot, ask me, how many hours a day am I supposed to study? I, you know, like a typical Jew, I ask, how many hours are you studying? You know, I answer a question with a question sometimes. And you know, I'm expecting a Bachur and a Yeshiva to tell me they study, I don't know, 10 hours, 12 hours, and they're kind of checking their account to see if it's good. You know, trying to look, you know, impressive to the rabbi as a tzaddik. But once in a while, I get reality checked to me. 
Why? Because the Bachur Yeshiva tells me I study for four hours a day. Excuse me? Wait, you go to Yeshiva? Yeah, from what time to what time? From 10 to 2. What do you mean? What, what, why? What do you do with the rest of the day? No, I'm busy. I got other stuff. I can't. It's 10 to 2. That's the schedule. I said, oh, and what do you do? you work? He goes, no, my, my, my family's complaining. They want me to work, but I'm really too busy. What do you do? Oh, I have hobbies. I tell him, sorry, but uh, you're not doing so good. Your account is a little deficient. Well, how many hours should I study? I don't know, at 18 years old with no responsibilities, 16 hours is not too much. But let's just be, free, you know, let's just be realistic. If you can get to 10, you're doing great. Because you don't have any responsibilities, you don't have a wife, you don't have any kids, you don't have any bills, you don't have anything. Yeah, but Rabbi, then I'll have to eliminate all my hobbies. Yeah, well, whatever those hobbies are, it's either that or gay or no, but I mean, that's up to you. Your choice. I'm just here to deliver information. Now, if you would tell me you're a professional, you work and you do this, you do that, then I would say four hours is good. Four hours is good. But if you're an 18, 19, 20 year old with nothing, what makes you think four hours is good? Sometimes people think because they spend a lot of time arguing on the internet, that, that's like the equivalent of learning Torah. It is Torah, but it's not Limut Torah, it's Bitul Torah. It's wasting time. Arguing on the internet, even with the biggest heretics in the world, is a waste of time. There's no mitzvah whatsoever. Why? They're not going to change and neither are you. Go open a book instead. Watch a shield. Do something useful. You can't? Go get a job. But to go argue on the internet, play on Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and be the, the news channel for the community. He knows everything about everything in the world that's happening. Every day he sends 15 different articles that are written in 20 different websites. How do you have time to read this stuff? Go read a Rambam or something. What, aren't I supposed to be aware of the world? I don't know, you're becoming the world. With that much news. In reality, Rabotai, everyone has time. It's just that we have to choose to use our time. And Ramchal says that part of that time should be an hour delving on what did I do with my time. What did I do with my time? What would I do with my time tomorrow if I get it? Because no one promises me tomorrow. This is honoring Hashem. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Megillah, page 14a, brings an extraordinary thing that happened in, 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 in history. A tzaddikah named Dvora. Tzaddikah named Dvora is called, the Gemara says, Dvora Eshet Lapidot. Why is Dvora Eshet Lapidot? It's based on the teachings by Eliyahu Navi. You want to know what Eliyahu Navi said? I'm going to tell you. Tana Deve Eliyahu. Eliyahu Navi taught Rav Anan. All of this, he teaches here. In Tana Deve Eliyahu, Perek Tet, section Aleph. Udvora Eshet Lapidot. What is Dvora Eshet Lapidot? Udvora Isha Nevia Eshet Lapidot, Ishofta et Israel Baitei. This is a pasuk in the book of Judges, chapter 4, verse 4. Dvora is the prophet. She's a woman lapidot. What's this, what's this lapidot? She is a judge of Am Yisrael at that time. Chamim said, how could it be that a woman is a judge? Today, it's women want to be rabbis. And we say no, but we have Dvora. That was Eshet Lapidot. She was a judge. She was, how could it be? Even further, Eliyahu Navi says, she 
But what was so good about this Dvorah that she was a judge of, among Am Yisrael and a prophetess among them, when at the same time we had, it's not like we didn't have, we had a prophet, Pinchas ben Elazar. So why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu make a woman prophet? Needless to say, a judge. So some Chachamim say it wasn't that she was really a judge, but rather she was a very big Chachama, and the wise men, the Chachamim, would go to her and say, what's, uh, what's the truth here? And then they would tell the people. Then they would tell the people. She wouldn't actually sit in a Bedin. That's the majority opinion, is that she wasn't actually a Dayan like you have today, a Dayan a Bedin, but rather she was a big Chachama, she was a prophet too, and the Chachamim knew this and respected her, and came to her and asked her, what's this, what's that? And she would tell them, and then they would pass in like her. But nonetheless, she was still a prophet. Why? Why make a woman prophet? Gemara Masechet Megillah says we had 48 prophets that are mentioned in the Tanakh, that are, that are males, and seven females. Dvorah was one of them. Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu make Dvorah a prophet? What merit did she have? Eliyahu Navi asked the question, and he gives us the answer. That's the great part of Eliyahu Navi. He has the questions, and he also has the answers. Made alai et a shamayim vet aritz. Ben Israel u ben goi. Ben ish u ben isha. Ben aved u ben shifcha. A kol le fia maase shu se. Kach ruach a kodesh shora alav. He says, I swear to you. And the, may the heaven and the earth as my witness. This is a vow that Eliyahu Navi is making, meaning take this seriously. I'm not joking. I swear to you, and as the heaven and the uh, earth be the, uh, my witnesses, whether a person is Israel, meaning a Jew, or a non-Jew, whether it's a man or a woman, whether it's a servant or a, mis a mistress or a woman servant, everything is based on their actions to the extent where all of them can get to a point of having Ruach HaKodesh. What is Eliyahu Hanavi telling us here? It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't even matter where you are. It matters where you want to go. Whether you're a Jew, Gentile, man, woman, the richest man in town, or a servant in some rich man's house. If your actions warrant it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu can give you Ruach HaKodesh. You can know HaKadosh Baruch Hu's thoughts, live. To teach us what? That's why Dvora was chosen to be a Naviyah. She did something special. What did she do? Did she know the whole Shas by heart? Like Rav Kanievsky? And the Yawa Navi says, Kachamru. They said that the husband of Dvorah was Amaretz, was Ignoramus. Says she told her husband, Why don't you come and let's make wicks, special wicks? To be used in the Bet Hamikdash, that's in Shiloh, to sanctify Hashem's name. They'll use it in the menorah. We'll make wicks. You're not a big chacham. You're not going to write any books. You're not going to teach anybody. But at least let's do something. For what? Ma'im yechel kecha ben anashim k'sherim shebaim, v'tiskel la'olam haba. Says that way. You'll connect yourself by going, by doing this, you'll connect yourself to kosher people, to chachamim, to righteous people. You'll be doing something, you're bringing something to the table, and you'll be among chachamim, you'll be among righteous people. That way, perhaps you will merit to have a share in the world to come. Because surely you're not going to merit it by being uh, an amaretz, an ignoramus, you're not... So you have to do something. What can we do? Let's make wicks.
והוא היה עושה פתילות עבות כדי שיהיה אורן מרובה. לפיכך נקרא שמו לפידות. And he ended up listening to his smart wife and not only made the lapidot, but he made it for the sake of heaven, meaning he's not selling them, he's not making money out of it, he's not marketing it, I am the best in town. He's doing it simply like his wife suggested. I'm making it the best possible way so they use my lapidot, my, my wicks, because surely other people could do too, but I'm going to make them really thick so that way The fire is even brighter, that way there's even more light, that way there's more sanctity, that way there's more uh, sanctity of Hashem's name. And because of that he was called Lapidot. He was given the name Lapidot because he made the Lapidot. And he was called three names, Barak, Lapidot, Michael. Barak was his name because his face was like a Barak. Why Barak? His face after. He did this, what seems to be a simple act, but day in, day out, sanctif sanctified HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name on a regular basis, making these beautiful wicks, thick wicks, bringing them all the way to Shiloh, making sure it's the best of the best, Continuously improving it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw how beautiful his actions are and he brightened his face. Similar to how Moshe Rabbeinu's face was brightened when he came down from Mount Sinai. That's why his name was Barak. Because his face became very, very bright from the holiness that came out of this. Not because he wrote books and gave lectures, but rather because of an act of Mesirut Nefesh for the sake of Hashem's name. Lapidot, he was called because he made the Lapidot really avot, he used to make him very, very thick. And Michael was after the name of the angel, Michael. And then Aliyah Navi says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Bochen Libo Duklayotu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He checks the, le the, the, the hearts and the livers of everyone. You too meant to do all of this for the sake of heaven, to honor my name, to make this beautiful thick wicks, to sanctify my name. To make my name even bigger, I'm going to make you bigger among Am Yisrael. So we see from here that the actions, the behavior of a person, of what he chooses, what she chooses to do with her time, is significant. A person can have a good job or a bad job. But a Kadosh Baruch is not going to choose, is not going to... Uh, decide whether that person goes to heaven or not, whether he's making a lot of money or not making a lot of money. He will decide whether they go to heaven or, or, or not based on what they do with the little money or a lot of money that they do, with the little time or a lot of time that they have, with the little skills or a lot of skills that they have. That's how Kadosh Baruch judges us. So now we have... The words of the sages teaching us that if we do a self-accounting each and every single day, we can evaluate how much time we really have, how much learning we should do, what is our purpose in life, what's the point of everything that we're doing. Use whatever tools that Kadosh Baruch Hu gave us in order to earn ourselves a place in heaven, earn ourselves a place next to the wise men, next excuse me, next to the sages. Even if somebody's not going to be the greatest Chacham in the world, the biggest uh, Kiruv uh, uh, Rabbi, the biggest Torah scholar, even if not, a person can get to Ruch HaKodesh. 
So on one end, we see that in reality, it's not that difficult. But at the same token, we started off the shiul in a different way. We said that a person can lose everything. Because of clothes. We're not even talking about Imada's clothes. Because of music. We're not even talking about music that talks about filth. Because of video games. We're not even talking about video games that kill people. Is that a reality? On one end, it seems like I could earn my place, a place in heaven. Not so, it's not so difficult. Just choose your time wisely. Prioritize. Use whatever skills a Kadosh Baruch Hu gave you. If a Kadosh Baruch Hu gave you skills where you make a lot of money, use that money wisely. Invest it in Torah. How much? As much as possible. I know one woman. She says, listen, I don't have a lot of skills in the world, but I know how to make money, Rabbi. And what I want to do with this money, I want to invest it in Torah. I said, okay, Baruch Hashem, great, uh, go for it. She goes, no, no, but <laughs> I need your help. I want to invest it in this and this and this and this and this. And I said, wait, well, how much are you going to leave yourself? She goes, nothing. I said, what do you mean nothing? She goes, I don't need it. I need to pay my bills. Everything else I don't need. I said, no, no, you don't need to. You can just give 20%. That's already a lot. That's great. She goes, but what am I going to do with the rest? I said, I don't know, buy stuff. She goes, what am I going to buy? I already have what I need. I have the house. I have the kids. I have this. I have this. I don't need the rest of it. And there are certain people that they literally, they... They see the world with such clarity that it's, it's a very unique thing. And even though you say to people, listen, you know, if you give 10%, it's great. 10% of your income is great. If you're very, very wealthy, you should give a lot more. You need to give a lot more. If you want to give 20%, it's fantastic. But when it comes to Torah, there's actually no limitation. You can give everything. But again, can you really give everything? Most people know. Most people, no, no, listen, I want to save for rainy day, for, 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 for a snowy day, for, for a hot day also, for a vacation day, for an off day, and an on day, and a work day, and a lot of days. Before you know it, $50. Fine, $50 if you have only $50, by all means. But if you have 500000 in the stock market account and $50 is your stock up, it's not exactly uh, such a big deal. So a person has skill. They know how to make money, use that skill. You don't have money, but you have a skill. You're an artist, you're a musician, you are, I don't know, whatever you are. Use that skill. You also have time, like everybody else. Learn. You don't need to learn only because you aspire to become the biggest rabbi in the world or the biggest, uh, you know, scholar out there. You need to learn for the sake of learning. So on one end, we see that somebody that was an ignoramus, earned a place in Olam Abba, a place in the Tanakh, in eternity, for making wicks. So it's not really that difficult like people make it seem to be. On the other end, to say that a person can lose everything just because he wore tight jeans and listened to rap music, that seems like it's too easy to lose everything. So before we can conclude that, we have to find ourselves a friend. And I don't know if I should say I'm sorry to say, but I'm sorry to say, we found a friend. Rav Shlomo Klugel, Rav Shalom, was a gaon. A gaon among gaonim. A giant. Lived about 170 years ago. Rav Shlomo Kluger wrote an endless amount of books. He wrote a book about every parasha in the Torah of all the chidushim that he had. Now you read the weekly parasha. If you're just starting out, perhaps everything is new to you. But to have a real chidush, you're lucky if you have one. If you're very smart, very dedicated, maybe you'll have one or two or three. Over time, It'll become less frequent because you've read the same thing and, you know, you need to work harder. The gifts don't come for free. Each book about each parasha. We're not talking about a book about the entire Torah. 
each parasha is between 500 to 800 pages. And it's not like big letters, lots of space you can take a vacation in. Tiny little letters about each parasha. Rav Kluger was a giant among giants. And many poskim bring him. In his responsa, called Tuv Tam Da'at. And his responsa, Tuv Tam Da'at, in Chelek Aleph, he wrote thousands of chuvot, thousands of answers to halachic issues. And this answer, from my perspective, is the scariest answer I've ever seen in my life. Scarier than anything I've ever told you guys about Ganom. Why? Because it shows how easy it is to lose everything. In Chelek Aleph, Tshuva Kuf Pei Tet, he says the following, the change of clothes that causes a person, no, I'm sorry, the change of clothes can cause a person to become a mumar against the entire Torah. Change of clothes can cause a person to become an infidel against the entire Torah, like a heretic. And let me show you how he says. He brings the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse number 4. Jeremiah says, Echal Hashem Emma. The sanctuary of Hashem are they. In essence, Hashem is saying, we are a sanctuary, we are a special people. Rav Kluger says, what do we learn from this verse? What do we learn from these few, uh, few words? That we are, that Hashem, okay, decided to tell us we are a sanctuary. In reality, the, the beginning of that verse starts a little different. It actually says, sanctuary, sanctuary, sanctuary. You're not my sanctuary, but in essence it's saying that uh, don't believe these false speakers that tell you you don't have to do tshuva because you think that just because I chose you that means that your everything is perfectly fine. But Rav Kluger brings this part of the verse where it says, no, no, but you're my sanctuary. They are, you are my special people. What do we learn from this? What do we learn that we are a sanctuary? Because it's brought also in different parts of the Torah. That a Jew that acts like a Gentile in any fashion is immediately judged as an infidel. As it's written in Psikta Zutreta, Yalkut Reuveni, in Parashat Kedoshim, in Perik Chaf, Perik 20, 26. Perik Chaf, Pasuk Chaf Vav. Regarding the verse that Hashem says in the Torah, I will distinguish you from among the nations, in order to tell us that when you are separate, meaning when you, you as a nation, when you are separate from the nations, you're mine. And if you're not, then you belong to the Akum, to the Gentiles. In order to teach us that Am Yisrael when it doesn't distinguish themselves from the Gentiles, they're immediately decreed as goyim. What are some examples of this? Before we continue. Political correctness. Patriotism. These are some of the common things out there. Being a Yefenefish, wanting to look like friendly with everybody, united with everyone. People are politically correct. Why? I'm afraid to offend the homosexuals. I'm afraid to offend the, the lesbians that pretend like they are, uh, they're men. I don't need to tell the children what gender they are. 
they asked a group of women, including a public official, define woman. Define woman. Define what is a woman. I'm sorry, I, I can't define a woman. Why not? Define a woman. Anyone that feels like a woman in their heart is a woman. But what if they have the genitalia of a man and the chromosomes of a man? But if he feels like a woman, then he's a woman. If your father felt that way, then you wouldn't be here. Maybe perhaps we should pray that your father would have done that. Don't decide the gender of the kids. Let them decide for themselves. This lefty liberal nonsense is one of the most disgusting things on the planet today. And unfortunately, you will also find it in the Jewish world, and I don't even mean the Jewish world that's anti-Torah, but rather the Jewish world that is sometimes so-called religious. So politically correct, they start removing and uprooting parts of the Torah, telling you to tell people about punishment is not appropriate for the generation. You need to teach the Torah of the year 2022. That God loves them no matter what. Well, it's not true. He doesn't love them no matter what. In fact, he says so. A bunch of times. God doesn't punish. Okay, then explain the kid that only has one hand. Explain the parents that lost the child. Explain the Holocaust. Explain cancer. Explain financial loss. Explain divorce. Explain stomach aches. Explain pain for no reason. Explain war. Oh, we never know those things. Oh, you don't know those things, but you know God loves you and he doesn't punish. That you know. This is political correctness. This is filth. This is heretical. In a few moments, I will show you that this is idol worship. Mamash. Looking at things from a completely different perspective now. It's no longer looking at the menaces of the world and the YYs as heretics. But rather idol worshippers. No different than some guy praying to a statue. This type of mentality is corrupting the world, needless to say, the Jewish world. But there's other things, such as this patriotism. A group of Frum kids, some from the Hasidic world even, decided that Ukraine is a victim. And they're going to go fight for them. Yeah, but you live in America. You live in Israel. What, what's to you in Ukraine? No, it's not fair what the Russians are doing. We're going to go defend Ukraine. You are going to go defend Ukraine. Why? First of all, that's question number one. Two, are you stupid? Why are you patriotic for Ukraine? Have you read history? Do you have nothing to do with your life? No, this is the right thing to do. We're Jews. We're bringing good to the world. Did you get a posek to say such a thing? Can you give me one posek in the world that actually agrees with the stupidity you just said? I'm going, Rabbi. I know it's the right thing in my heart. Okay, I'll prepare Kaddish. I want to tell you. And you have religious boys that live in America, that live in Israel, get on planes, and go, decide they're going to fight for Ukraine. The very same nation that tortured us much worse than the Nazis. The very same nation that to this day has Nazis. The very same nation that some of them that actually entered Israel are Nazis. There's a huge group of Nazis in Eretz Israel already for years, for decades. Torturing people. Almost every member is, an, is a Ukrainian. But you're going to go defend them because they're victims, according to you. This 
patriotism for America, patriotism for Ukraine, patriotism for whoever you are, is horrendous. But unfortunately in the world today it's admirable. There's a well-known heretic that was a writer named Amos Oz, Shem Reshaim Yerkav. He wrote his commentary on the Tanakh. So popular that his books were published in 45 different languages. Got awards, publicity, endless amount of fame and fortune. No end to his genome. I don't even think seventh level is enough for him. What was his commentary on the Torah? He wrote, he read, I don't even know why he read the, 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 the Tanakh, but he decided, but apparently maybe it's a, I don't know, famous like a history book, I guess. But this is what the scholar in the secular world of the Jews wrote on our Torah. In the section of the Torah where it talks about how Am Yisrael, after being slaves and going through a holocaust for over a century, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told them, before you leave Egypt, take advantage of the Egyptians. Take some stuff from them. I mean, you worked for free. They killed you, tortured you. Take some stuff. Why? Because I promised Avram, your forefather, that when you leave Egypt, you'll leave with a lot of stuff. So this is one of the ways that I'm going to give you money. Some they're going to give you, some you're going to take, some you're going to find, and so on and so forth. So the Pasuk says, the verse says, that when Am Israel left Egypt, they took advantage of the Egyptians. This Amos Oz, Rasha Merusha, writes, Lama! Why? Disgusting nation! This is what he writes. This is his commentary. This is what he writes. This is actually what it was actually. This is what he writes about his own people. Now I don't even care if you're religious or not religious. Did you read the what happened before? Before you decided we're a disgusting people that because we took advantage of the Egyptians. Did you read who the Egyptians are? What they did to us? How long we were slaves? How long was the Holocaust? How long we worked for free? How much they tortured us? Before you decide that we're a disgusting people. Did you read it? But this is what he wrote. Why take advantage of the Egyptians? What disgusting people we are, these Jews. What is this mentality, the depth of this? What is this? This is when somebody is not just a self-hating Jew. This is when somebody connects to the nations a whole lot more than he connects to his own people. Unfortunately, when people want, they desire, they aspire to go fight in some foreign army. They want to be patriotic. They make their careers and their life all about their country, their America, their whatever country they live in. There's a, there's, there's a significance to that. The significance is that they connect, they relate to the nation more than their own nation. And that's a problem. Even if those people keep Shabbat, even if those people keep kosher, even if they learn Torah. Regardless of where you live, whether you are all from America, and the people that are watching are from all over the world, Baruch Hashem. If you consider yourself an Australian, an American, uh, even an Israeli, before you consider yourself Jewish, that's a problem. That's a problem. Because patriotism is not a mitzvah. And in fact, many times, it actually is a symptom to a distorted mentality. Now, I'm not saying you should go against the country you live in. The Pekiavot says you should actually pray for the nation that you live in, that uh, if it wasn't for the rules that they have, that people would kill each other and eat each other alive. So we're not saying go against the countries you live in. We're not saying be anti, be against, but remember where you came from. Because if you don't, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will send the Goy to remind you. 
Now, Rav Kluger brings this and he says that when we are distinguishing ourselves, we actively distinguish ourselves from the nations, then we're his. But when we don't, then we belong to the Gentiles. And he now brings the Gemara Maseret Sanhedrin, page 75a. He says, how did we get to this? He says, let's evaluate how to arrive at such a conclusion. That when a person changes their clothes, they can be considered, or they are considered, and they're decreed in heaven as someone that's an infidel against the entire Torah. Even if they keep Shabbat, they learn Torah, they do mitzvot, they give tzedakah, they do everything, they're considered an infidel. How could that possibly be? He says, look at how the world works in accordance to Hashem. Barama Masechet Sanhedrin, page 75a. We have the whole sugya about the Ben Soreru More, the wayward child. Wayward child, drank too much, ate too much, was, went against his parents. Bedin kills him. Now, of course, it's not as simple as I just said, but more or less, that's the argument. The question the Chachamim, all of them ask is, how could it possibly be? He's just a little kid. He's 12 years old. He's not even bar mitzvah. Torah responds, kill him while he's still meritorious before he becomes a criminal. But how, when do we see in the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu judges us and punishes us on something we didn't do yet? Now, if you're going to say, okay, this guy's a bad kid, he's eventually going to become a murderer because he eats too much, he drinks too much, he's disrespectful, and he's eventually going to become some, I don't know, Satanist, fine, but who said, where do you see in the Torah where Kadosh Baruch Hu punishes somebody before he became a criminal? Even Ishmael, Ishmael Rasha, Merusha, but he did tshuva. How come Kadosh Baruch Hu allowed him to do tshuva while he was still Rasha? Because Kadosh Baruch Hu. When the angel said, let's kill this guy, There's a, his descendants are going to torture your children. Hashem says, I don't punish people before they make sins. So we have actually a whole, a whole thing, it's a, it's, it's, it's a contradiction. Esav. Esav was a Rasha Merusha, but he lived a life. How come HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't kill him when his descendants are going to be Amalek? The enemy of God. Am Yisrael itself. Am Yisrael itself. What, HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't know the future? Is there such a reality? No, HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows everything. The past, the present, the future, he's everything. So that means he knew that when he was taking us out of Egypt, that some of us were going to take idols with us. Micha brought an idol with him. Meaning that HaKadosh Baruch Hu split the ocean and there's not just people crossing, there's idols too. The guy brought an idol with him. We went to Mount Sinai. Golden calf. What, Hashem didn't know it? He knew it. So how come he didn't just kill us? Why didn't he just leave us in Egypt? If the argument is that he's going to punish us before we make sins, then how did we actually survive getting out? But at the same token, we see in the Torah itself, a little kid does certain things, bet gets the permission to kill him. Meaning it's a mitzvah to kill him. Rav Kluger says, because they judge him based on things that are not necessarily easy to see at first look. What is that? The bet Dean kills him while he's meritorious, while he's still before Bar Mitzvah, because at this point, the magnitude of his sins, the damage for his sins is still very limited because he's before Bar Mitzvah. And the uh, Torah says in the book of Leviticus, in Parashat Kedoshim, chapter ni- uh, 19, verse number 3. Very interesting verse that uh, sheds some more light on it. Where it says, Ish imo ve'aviv tirau ve'et shabetotai tishmoru ani Adonai lo'echem Your mother and father shall you revere and my Shabbats shall you observe 
I am Hashem your God. So the basic understanding that we have of it is what the Gemara says, Maseret Sanhedrin, that Akadosh Baruch Hu says that you have an obligation to honor your parents, but you also have an obligation to honor the, to, to fulfill all of the rest of the mitzvot, like Shabbat. And if your parents are telling you to violate my mitzvot, always remember that I'm God and I come before your parents. But Rav Kluger says an additional explanation of why the verse is lined up this way. Why it says, parents honoring them, observe Shabbat, and I am God. And he says that a person needs to fear his mother and his father and observe Shabbat and always remember that it's God. It's meant that at the moment that a person is disrespectful to his parents, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, I did good by not being among them. Because if I was among them, meaning if he was closer to us, if the Shekhinah was still next to us, I'd be saddened by their actions. And from there we learn that when a person disrespects their parents, it leads the Shekhinah to leave him. To leave Israel. Young boy, young girl, parents ask him to clean their room, parents ask him to do something, and they answer, No, nah, come on, I don't feel like doing it. I'm not doing it. Whatever presence God has on that boy or girl, that Kadosh Bahu protecting them immediately leaves. Yeah, what about this boy learned a lot of Torah, did a lot of mitzvot, did a lot of good things? Great. Congratulations, you just lost all of it. Why? HaKadosh Baruch just left. Why? Disrespecting your parents. The same thing if a person desecrates Shabbat. Because the Zohar HaKadosh says that HaKadosh Baruch even when Am Yisrael sins, the nation in general is sinning, he still stays among Am Yisrael so long as there are still some that observe Shabbat. To teach us that if somebody desecrates Shabbat, the Shekhinah leaves. So therefore, if you observe Shabbat and you honor your parents, then I am Hashem. Just like the Pasuk says, honor your parents, observe Shabbat, I am Hashem. Which Rav Kluger says, which means that if, what the Pasuk is trying to teach you, if you honor your parents and you observe Shabbat, then I am Hashem, meaning then I am on top of you, then I am protecting you, then the Shekhinah is right next to you. But if you don't, I'm out of here. And therefore we learn from the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat that the Yetzirah, tries to entice a person to do a different sin every opportunity he can. Today he tells him to do this, tomorrow he tells him to do this, and if he listens, that gives the Yetzirah even more strength to entice him to something bad. He starts off by throwing something across the uh, room. Before you know it, the Yetzirah has enticed him to worship an idol. Because today he followed what, he, what the Yetzirah instructed him to do, to go break something, to go rip something. Tomorrow he's going to tell him to do it again. The next day he's going to tell him to do it again. Steal, break, this, that. Before you know it, he's going to lead him to Christianity. And therefore, Rav Klugel says, that Ben Soreru More, he is judged on his future actions. Why is he judged on his future actions? Because since he dishonored his parents, immediately the Shekhinah left. And we need this Shekhinah, why? Because the Torah teaches us that if it's not for the Shekhinah, if it's not for Hashem, there's no way for us to beat the Yetzirah. We don't have the strength to beat the Yetzirah by ourselves. The Yetzirah is trying to entice us to do a lot of bad things. He's strong, he's smart, he's everything. But we beat him because the Akadosh Baruch helps us. But what if HaKadosh Baruch not there? If he left, then we don't have the strength. When does he leave? When we desecrate Shabbat and we dishonor our parents. 
And therefore, Rav Kluga says, the Ben Soel Moreh, the reason why he's killed is because we know for sure he's going to be a criminal. It's not a, it's not a, a speculation. We know for sure he's going to be a criminal. We know for sure he's going to be an idol worshiper. How do we know? Because since he is disrespecting his parents, then the Shekhinah left, which means that this guy that's constantly making more and more sins, nothing's going to help him. He's just going to make Gus Lishchina left. He has no protection. There's no way to beat the Yetzirah. It's better to kill him now before the sins count as much, much more significant because he now becomes a man. And therefore, for us, for us simple people, Arav Kluger says, when a person leaves the Echal Hashem, leaves the sanctuary of Hashem, Then the Shekhinah leaves them. To be among the nations. When does, the, when does such a thing happen? The moment a person wants to emulate the gleam with his clothes, with his desires, with his music, with her aspirations, the Shekhinah leaves. And the moment the Shekhinah leaves, there's no protection. And therefore in Shamaim, immediately that person is decreed a Mumal. Not that he already desecrated the entire Torah already, but it's guaranteed it's going to happen. Why? He has no protection anymore. The Shekhinah is not there anymore. And that's how we conclude, Rav Kluger says, that even change of clothing makes a person mumar against the entire Torah because he has no more protection like he had when he was still under the sanctuary of Hashem. From there we learn Rabbi Karim in my perspective, it's the scariest thing in the world. Where a person can literally live in this world 30, 40 years, learn, do this, do that, but just one day decide that he wants to be more stylish. One day decides that he wants to be popular. He wants to do all types of things because he is having a midlife crisis. She's having a midlife crisis. And the protection that she had by the Shekhinah being on her, the protection that he had by the Shekhinah being on them, by them being part of the sanctuary of Hashem, that got them to this point, that got them to do all those mitzvot, that got them to stay away from all the bad people, all that protection that they had for the 30, 40, 50 years, they don't realize the second they changed their wardrobe, Everything is leaving. It's not just the shirt is changing. It's not just the shoes are changing. It's not just the neighborhood is changing. It's not just the car that's changing. It's whatever protection you had from a Kadosh Baruch Hu until that point is gone. And that's why in Shemaim, Rav Kluger says, immediately they're decreed like an infidel. As if they've already violated, they're going against the entire Torah. To see how simple it is, is scary. Because it's happening everywhere. People want to look and act like Goim. People are embarrassed of their Judaism. I never understood that. I always told people the most, the best thing you could do is look most Jewish, just like Rav Kanievsky would tell all the people that would come to him to grow pale, to have a beard, not because of some chasidut, but rather because that shows not just the world that you're Jewish, it reminds you that you're Jewish. The Ben Chai says that the peot of a person should be very thick. Why? You want to have strong witnesses. And the peot are witnesses. Witnesses of the covenant. You have a covenant that you breed me but you didn't really have much free choice. Unless you're a convert, you didn't have much free choice. You were eight days old. Nobody asked you if you want to have a breed me or not. 
So the Ben Yishai says, have big peot. Why have big peot? That's your witnesses. You want them to be strong. You want them to be big. You want them to testify to HaKadosh Baruch I'm proud that I'm one of your sons. I'm proud that I'm one of your kids. But when a person is looking for every possible way not to look Jewish, he actually rather look like 50 Cent, he rather look like Little Wayne, he rather look like LeBron James, he rather be like them. It's not only that they're making a mistake for themselves and for their kids and their family and everything else in the future and the past and everything else, but they're literally losing much more than they can possibly imagine and it makes it very difficult to recover. This is the reason why when you see Bachurei Yeshivot, that even if they don't believe, even if they have problems, they have heretical thoughts and all types of things, so long as they continue going to the Yeshiva and dressing the, the part, they don't go off completely. They do stupid things, but they stay within like, you know, somewhat within the four walls. But as soon as they change their clothes, as soon as the guy has some mohawk, as soon as the guy has some earring, all of a sudden you see the guys getting tattoos, non-Jewish girlfriend, smoking on Shabbat. Like all of a sudden you see this guy that learned Torah for 20, 25 years, all of a sudden he's a rock star. Like what, what happened? How did you go from this to that? You didn't even have enough time to listen to the music yet, to act, to look like them. Like, what, what did you do? Like, how did this happen? The Shekhinah left. Because so long as you looked apart, you still had the Shekhinah there. Even though you were obnoxious, even though you did stupid things, even though God was upset at what you were doing, the Shekhinah was still there protecting you from completely breaking loose. But the second you changed your clothes, the second you started looking like them, you became like them instantly. And the only question I had about this to my Rav, when he told me this, and I almost had a heart attack, is, can I still count those people in Minyan? He says, yes. Because so long, halachically speaking, they're still Jewish. And if they keep Shabbat, you can still count them in Minyan. Their problem is in Shemaim. They're considered an infidel in Shemaim. Now, I keep saying they. We all have to realize that it could be us, chas v'shalom. It could be our kids, our cousins, our brothers. Just like that. Why? Change of wardrobe, change of attitude, change of perspective. To something that's foreign to the Torah. Now, of course, today there's a lot of things that are foreign to the Torah. And before we get to the questions part, I wanted to bring something from the Rambam and also from the Chinuch that gives us clarity of what certain things mean and what they don't mean. We have 613 mitzvot. The Gemara in Masechet Makot says, where do we get 613 mitzvot. Where do we know we have 613 mitzvot? It says from the Pasuk, Torah tzivalanu Moshe Morasha. That Moshe Rabbeinu, he's the, the one that brought us the Torah. And from the word Torah, the sages in the Gemara Masechet Makot says, that's the numerical value, that's 613. But then the sage says, but it's not 613. It's 611. It's not 613. 611. So, ah, yes, it's, it's 611 that Moshe Rabbeinu taught us. Because the first two, that God is the God that took us out of, he, I am God that took you out of Egypt, and don't have a foreign God, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu taught us. Himself, first two commandments. First two commandments, HaKadosh Baruch Hu taught us. The other 611, HaKadosh Baruch Hu taught Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu taught Am Israel. That's 613. But what does it really mean, Hashem took us out of Egypt? Because technically it sounds like a statement. It sounds like a statement. I took you out of Egypt. Like, how is that a commandment? How is that a commandment? Now, the Sefer HaChinuch, Mitzvah number 25, says, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, Asher Otsetich HaMeretz Mitzrayim Mibet Avadim. 
Mitzvah number 25, obligation to believe in the existence of Hashem, blessed be He, comes from the verse, I am Hashem your God, who has taken you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. The Chinuch says, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu suspended the natural order of the universe at His discretion, to show us that He is the one creator who continues to control all the natural forces, and since the Jewish people were witnesses to those miracles, and by extension to his existence and omnip uh, omnipotence, HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself describes himself to them as the one who has taken them out of Egypt. And therefore we are commanded to believe that the world has one creator who brought into existence all that exists, and that his power and his will have brought about and continue to bring about everything that is, everything that was, everything that will be forever and ever. That he is in control of everything. That has transpired, that does transpire, that will transpire from the beginning to the end of history. And that he took us out of bondage in the land of Egypt and gave us the Torah, which were so commanded, as it says in the beginning of the giving of the Torah. Now, great. Believing in a creator, lots of people believe in a creator. Chinuch says, wrong answer. Why? Not believing in a creator. It's believing in this creator. Meaning, not just to believe in a creator, but to believe in the God of Israel that has specific qualities that are mentioned. As the Rambam Paskets in Sefer HaMitzvot The Rambam Paskins and talks about how the commandment to merely believe in the existence of God is not enough but rather that a person has to believe in the special qualities about God that a person must acknowledge in order to fulfill the commandment Now, when a person looks at most people's belief in God, they'll find that most people don't necessarily believe in the God of Israel. They believe in a creator, but when it comes to divine providence, when it comes to how involved he is in, in their life, it's not exactly it. But the first commandment to believe that he's the God that took us out of Egypt is of paramount importance. Because if a person doesn't believe in it the right way, they also have no share of the world to come. And the Chinuch says that a person has to know and believe that the world has a God because the word Anochi in the, in the, in the uh, verse that says Anochi Hashem Elokechem that I am uh, a God that Anochi is stated to teach us about the internal inherent existence of God and when he mentioned who has taken you out of the land of Egypt it means to tell you to let your heart not be seduced to perceive the matter of your exodus from slavery in Egypt and the plagues that befell the Egyptians as having occurred by chance. Rather, you have to be aware that it was I who performed those miracles and took you with the intent and with providence. And believing says the Chinuch, believing in God is something that a person must establish in their mind that there is one God that created everything who continues to control everything and that there is absolutely no possibility of any alternative to this 
to the extent that if somebody were to ask you, are you Jewish? Whether it be you are under attack, they're asking you, are you Jewish? And you see 10 Nazis around you, chas v'shalom, that if you say yes, they're going to kill you. Or you're a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of scuffers, you know, guys that like to make fun of Judaism. Former yeshiva bachurim. And they want to joke around. Are you Jewish? Because they want to make fun of Chabad or something like that. And you want to fit in. On one end, you want to live and you don't want the Nazis to kill you. So you don't want to really answer that you're Jewish. Because if you answer you're Jewish, you know what's following. They're only asking you because they want to know how fast you want a fist to hit your face. So you want to say, listen, save my life, right? Save my life. My life is worth more than me saying I'm Jewish, right? On the other hand, you're around a bunch of guys that make fun of religion all day. And if you don't fit in and say, make fun of it also, and say, oh, no, I'm not Jewish, then you're not going to be popular anymore. Says the Chinuch. A person that believes in God, the very same God that took us out of Egypt, must establish in their mind the truth that there is one creator and there is absolutely no possible, no possibility of an alternative to this. And this includes that if one was asked about it, that he would respond to everyone who inquires that this is what his heart believes and that he should not concede to any alternative to this belief, even if they threaten to kill him. Meaning, not only is somebody not allowed to say they're not Jewish as a joke, but they're also not allowed to say they're not Jewish to save their life. Under what Violation, saying you're not Jewish, idol worship. And we know we have three cardinal sins that we have to die for and not sin. Saying you're not Jewish is idol worship. That's what the Chinuch says. That's what the Rambam says. And this Rabotai is even giving the impression that a person denies God or his existence or an omnipotence or even expressing any doubt in the truth of Hashem is the same as idolatry. Which one is required to sacrifice their life to avoid doing. And the laws of this mitzvah, we are obligated to believe regarding God that all ability, all greatness, all strength, splendor, glory, all blessings, all endurance, all must be ascribed to Him. Take credit for nothing. And that we lack the faculty and intellect to even grasp in our minds and certainty to convey with words His greatness and benevolence. And due to the exaltness of His stature and His glory, He cannot be grasped by any being, only by Himself. And we must, with all of our mental faculties, recognize Him as precluded from any deficiency and anything inconsistent with absolute perfection and absolute virtue. Believing that Hashem has any deficiency, saying Hashem needs anything, is idol worship. It's not heretical anymore. It's idol worship. Saying you're not Jewish, idol worship. Now what if I say I'm Jewish, but I look not Jewish? Then you're an idiot. Because the very same God that was protecting you because you're Jewish just left because of your stupid clothes. The very same God that protected you, the very same God that you're in essence technically honoring because you're saying you're Jewish. 
You're saying you don't want to be an idol worshiper. So you're admitting you're a Jewish. You're proud of your Judaism per se. Then how come you're looking like them? Because that very same God that protected you until now leaves. And this Rabotai is a Sefer Chinuch. The same exact thing is said by the Rambam in Sefer HaMitzvot. Where the Rambam says, that this is under the mitzvah, number nine, positive mitzvah, to sanctify Hashem's name, that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu said in the Torah that I am, that I shall be sanctified in your midst of the children of Israel, the idea of this commandment is that we are commanded to publicize the true Jewish faith that believes in the one God and should not fear that someone will harm him in consequence of doing so, to the extent that if a tyrant would seek to coerce us to deny the exalted one, we must not heed him. Rather, we should give our lives away not to deny God. We must not even let him, meaning the tyrant, we, might not, no, we must not even let him receive the impression through any external uh, gesture or acceptance that we have denied God to our hearts, even though inside we really believe in God. We can't even look like we're denying God. We can't even look like we're not Jewish. And a person, he says this many times, a person is obligated to die for this. We're here to live. The only reason you showed up at a shield to lie in the middle of nowhere, Florida, is because you want to live forever. The best thing is that knowing this helps you live. It's scary, but it helps you live. Because now you know how much the outfit really costs, how much the neighborhood really costs. How much that attitude really costs? How much that hobby really costs? Acting like the goyim is no longer the same price. Once you know how much it really costs. Interestingly enough, this mitzvah is mentioned in the Rambam's negative mitzvah too. When he talks about idolatry. And when he gives different examples of idolatry, he talks about how one form of idolatry was to serve the demons, which is interesting because many heretics think that the Rambam doesn't believe in demons, even though he writes demons, and it's the Pesuk and the Torah writes demons. But further, he also says that one form of idolatry is offering hair to an idol named Kemosh. The entire wig industry today a real hair, what is it? It's hair being given to an idol. Rambam already mentioned it 800 years ago without going to India. Without going to India, Rabbi Shukhan Aruch. Yore Dea. Paskin the same halacha. Ilchot Avudat Kochavim, Siman Kuf Nun Vav. אסור לאדם לומר שהוא עובד כוכבים כדי שלא יהרגוהו אבל אם כדי שלא יכירו שהוא יהודי משנה מלבושו בשעת הגזירה מותר כיוון שאינו אומר שהוא עובד כוכבים It's forbidden for a person to say that he is not Jewish even if they're going to kill him as a result of it But to save his own life he's not allowed to say he's not Jewish He's allowed to change his clothes for the sake of saving his life because he's not saying anything that he's not Jewish but that's only to save his life. He's not allowed to change his clothes and look like a goy. We see how much is on the line. And the price changes. And even though, from my perspective, one of the scariest things, if not the scariest thing I've ever learned, because it just literally shows you how, like what Eliyahu Navi meant when he said to one of the, uh, one of the uh, Amoraim, that when he asked him how many people in this market are, have a share in the world to come, he said, no one. 
how could it be? The generation was full of amazing scholars, righteous people. Like, what do you mean? You get to see. You see. How could it be that there could be people that think they're religious? There could be people that are religious for all intents and purposes, but they lost something along the way that can cost them everything. So the more we know what the truth is, the more we could really live. Why? Because that way we could avoid all of these very expensive mistakes we don't even realize exist. So yes, no one really likes to learn about, oh, punishment and genom and this. And yeah, no one likes to learn it, but you need to do it. Just like you need to learn the traffic laws and just like you need to learn health and just like you need to learn everything else. To learn about the risks makes you safer. Whereas to avoid it, makes you crazy. To go in a plane without knowing and, and fly the plane without learning how to fly, that makes you a crazy terrorist. Even if you're just terrorizing yourself. But to go educate yourself before you fly a plane, before you drive a car, before you get married, before you live in this world for 70 years without even knowing what your purpose is, that's the least you can do for yourself. So that's one of the things that we all have to know. That Yes, HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us. But that's only when we allow Him to stay among us. If we kick Him out because we want to look like everybody else, who's there to love us? If we start saying that He's imperfect, that He's deficient, we're worshipping another God. If we start denying or being embarrassed of our Judaism, we're denying God. It's idol worship. What? How are you surprised that all these disasters happen in your life if you're constantly worshiping an idol? Why are you even bothering praying to Hashem while you're praying to the, some Baal at the same time? You're praying for some government member to win. You're praying for, for some team to win. You're praying for, for all the things that are against God to, to do good. And you want God to help you too? And that's the thing, Abutai. When the more you learn, the more you realize how ludicrous the opposite side is. When I first started learning and I first started teaching... And people would tell me all types of, you know, skepticism that they had or all types of uh, different things. I would be taken back if they, they had a kippah on and they were religious and they still said things that were heretical because I didn't have as much weapons. I didn't have as much knowledge. So it was defensive. I didn't, wasn't really sure how could it be that he's saying that and I would double check everything and then confirm that they were wrong. But still, it was always like, what's going on here? Baruch Hashem today... It's, you look at the world, that you're surrounded by crazy people. You're no longer upset that some, you know, ignoramus that calls himself a rabbi calls you fanatic, or a bunch of idiots that call themselves religious call you fanatic or call you crazy. That's not upsetting at all. Why? Because you know how clueless they are. You feel bad for them. You feel bad for anyone that thinks like them because the truth and them is so far apart. The, 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 the variance between the two, it's literally two different religions. They can call themselves Pikachu, Jewish, whatever they want. But the truth of Judaism, what we just read, in the Shulchan Aruch, in the Chinuch, in the Rambam, in the Gemara, in Eliyahu Navi's book, everywhere across the board, that truth... And what they say, it's two different religions. One is idolatry, one is Judaism. So the more we are comfortable with who we are and what we are, the easier it is for us to be that person, but also to warrant a Kadosh Baruch Hu to use us, to help other people around us, and even more so, to warrant a Kadosh Baruch Hu saving us. When he does finally send the Goel again, he sent us Moshe Rabenu because we had three merits. At the very least, we should have the same three merits. It doesn't take much. 
clothes, learn some Torah, don't be an idol worshiper. It's literally easy. Easy to get to Gan Eden. But even easier to get to Gehenom. Let's all be smart and do the best we possibly can to get to Gan Eden. With that being said, Bechavod, who wants to ask some questions? Yes? What does it mean to say the Jewish clothing? What does? What does it consider to the religious clothing? Jewish clothing, the most important thing is for it to be modest. Most important thing for Jewish clothing is for it to be modest. So it doesn't necessarily require for it to be a certain color. You don't necessarily need to walk around with a suit jacket and a white shirt at all times. There are perfectly righteous tzaddikim that do not wear suits, they, they, but they're still modest. So modesty is, is priority number one. And when a person lo loses modesty, once it's not modest, it doesn't really make a difference what it is. It could be a t-shirt, it could be a tank top, it could be a whatever, no shirt, whatever it is. It doesn't make much difference. Once it's not modest, it could be a million dollar shirt or a five dollar shirt, it's just the same. So the first priority is to make sure that wherever you are, you're presentable, you're modest. Meaning that if you are going to meet the, uh, I don't know, the president of your company, the president of your country, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Mashiach himself, that you would want to look this way, you'd be okay with it, then fine. But again, okay with it in accordance to God. Uh, sometimes people are okay walking around naked because you know, they're mentally deficient. You know, so it's, it's being modest. Being a modest person doesn't really take much. You can be modest when you're working. You can be modest when you're, when you're praying. You can be modest in different ways. Now again, if let's say you work with your hands, you're, you're a mechanic, you're a, uh, I don't know, you work in buildings and stuff like that, for you to wear a suit and tie is, is, is hazardous to your health. You can't wear a suit and tie if you're a construction worker. So you wear whatever appropriate clothes you need to wear. You don't need to wear a tank top or, or to have no shirt on. That's inappropriate regardless of what you do. So, you know, you can be a, a modest plumber, a modest uh, construction worker, a modest technician, you know, wearing a long sleeve shirt, wearing a, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, clothes that, you know, you're presentable for your profession. Now, for, for guys, there's more leniency when it comes to them wearing short sleeves, uh, but it's highly uh, advisable for a guy not to wear short sleeves when he prays. When he prays, you wear longer sleeve, uh, but if he's working and it's, a, uh, uh, it's necessary for whatever reason or more comfortable for him to be, have short sleeves, it's fine, but short sleeves, not tank tops. Uh, but oh, again, always wear a uh, tzitzit, it's very, very important. Now, for women, on the other hand, modesty is, a, uh, 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 you know, is, is very simple. You have to cover as much as possible to the extent where your standard is, your uh, elbows are always covered to the point of where you're you know, at the wrist. If you cover all the way to the wrist, that's ideal. But if you cover, let's say, uh, halfway to the wrist, that's also okay. Uh, as far as the, uh, the rest of the body, uh, you wear a dress or you wear a, uh, if you want to wear a skirt, it has to, the skirt, the minimum requirement, not ideal, but the minimum requirement is for the skirt to uh, reach six inches below the bottom of the knee after you sit down. Many times women get skirts or dresses or whatever it is, uh, and, but as soon as they sit down, the skirt comes up and it starts getting to the knee. That already makes the skirt not modest. The skirt has to be six inches beyond the bottom of the knee after you sit down. Truth be told, it's very hard to find modest skirts for most women today. Many times you have to customize them. But I promise you that whatever money you spent on making your clothes more modest, the Kadosh Baruch will pay you back. Will pay you back. Ideal is not the skirt that's six inches under the bottom of the knee. Ideal is for you to wear something that gets to the ankles. That's ideal. You want to be a tzaddika? Don't wear short skirts, period. Don't wear short skirts. You want to, even if the skirt is, you know, gets the, meets the halachic requirements, do you want to be the bottom of heaven too? Or do you want to be at the best part of heaven? The, the more you want for your eternity, the more you do. And this is an easy mitzvah. Why? Because whether you wear a skirt that's six inches from the bottom of your knee, or you wear a skirt or a dress that's, you know, gets to your ankles, nothing changes. 
In fact, the longer the skirt, the classier it looks, the better it looks. I mean, you're not going running. So you don't need to have something short. And if you're running, you can't run outside anyway. So any woman that's like running in some marathon, you should know that that's a hobby you have to stop immediately. There's no permission for women to run in public. So much so that Rav Nisim again would say it's better that she gets hit by a bus than run in public. Why? Because better she dies than, than, get, than, than run in public. Yeah, but I want to exercise. Exercise home. Get a treadmill, treadmill and run home if you want. Run after your kids, run on a treadmill, run after your husband, do a lot of running. You can run as much as you want, not in public. Why? It's not modest for a woman to run in public because people see your body move in certain ways and they get crazy thoughts in their mind. And yes, it's not your fault that they have a crazy mind, but it is your fault that you were used for them to activate that crazy mind. So the point is a woman wants to get to a good place she has to take advantage of some of these easy mitzvot. Because honestly, I, my wife told me that it's easier to find something that reaches your ankles than to find something that will reach six inches below the bottom of your knee. Because usually the ones that are like, you know, below the knee, it's like just cutting it. It's four, it's three, it's not even there, but you're imagining that it's there. And you have to keep going like this and it looks like you're exercising the whole time. Why? Why play with your Olam Abba like that? For what? What purpose? What do you get out of it? So again, if you want to play uh, 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 with it you are, or whatever, you're not comfortable, whatever it is and, you know, that, 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 uh, that's in your mind, you don't want to wear something all the way to your ankles, it's fine. But again, it has to be six inches below the bottom of the knee after you sit down. Not before you sit down. Before you sit down, it means nothing. So for a woman to cover her elbows, her neckline, uh, you know, her, uh, her legs, and the clothes to be loose. You know, sometimes women cover their, their body, they wear these uh, pencil skirts or pencil dresses, and they're gonna go into Ganom with the pencil dress and the pencil skirt. Why? Because it's, they look like they're naked. The, their every curve, everything uh, uh, you know, in the body is shown, this is completely inappropriate. So the looser, the better. Now I'm not telling you to wear a garbage pail, I'm not telling you to go wear a, a, a garbage bag. You could, you know, uh, wear something nice, but it doesn't, no one needs to know every curve you have in your body. It's just simply not necessary. So again, modesty also requires some common sense. Modesty requires common sense. The, uh, uh, it's also important to avoid certain things like uh, writing. Writing on your skirt, like if there's like, I don't know, Nike or Prada or, or whatever it is, whatever brand, whatever saying there is, and they, they put it right on your body, especially for women, definitely remove stuff like that. Why? Because automatically the mind of a person is to look at something that makes sense to him. So anytime there's a word, people look at it. And if that word is on your chest, then that's what they're going to look at. Yeah, but I didn't tell them to do it. Okay, no one told you you need to buy this shirt. So, again, you have to use common sense. And it's not so difficult. It's really not so difficult. When you want it, it becomes easy. When you don't want it, it's impossible. Anytime you don't want to do something, it's impossible to do it. All of a sudden, it's heavy. All of a sudden, you're tired. All of a sudden, everything is like, uh, you know, out of reach. But when you want to do something, you just find a way to do it. All of a sudden, you find sweaters that you like. All of a sudden, you find these things that, that, that look good. And... Truth be known is that if you look at any royalty that's ever existed in the world, whether it's royalty that's in the world today, for more or less, there's still a little bit of royalty left where, you know, in English, uh, in some places in Africa, they don't walk around with uh, showing their body. And they're fake royalty. They're royalty among men. They're royalty among women. They're, they're royalty among flesh and blood. We're royalty because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the King of Kings, is our father. So if they don't show their body, why are we showing our body? So that's the thing. A person needs to make sure that they're, you know, treat themselves like a Kadosh Baruch Hu wants them to be. And the more a person takes things into account, they'll realize, listen, this dress, it's nice, but it has a word right, you know, on the back or front or wherever it is and simply not there. Or sometimes it's certain shapes. You know, there's a certain beautiful dress or beautiful shirt, but there's a certain shape, a uh, triangle, in a place that's not exactly... Get it out of your closet, get it out of your house, get it out of your life. Don't sell it, don't give it nothing. Just anything that's not modest, don't give it to anybody. Throw it out, burn it, uh, you know, destroy it. If it's not good for you, it's certainly not good for anybody else. So, 
There are certain things you need common sense for. And the common sense comes if you actually want to do this. When, when you're like, when you want to do the mitzvot like it's a burden, like you don't really want to be modest, but you feel like, oh, maybe I, maybe I should be, all of a sudden it's really, really difficult. But when you have a drive to be modest, or you have a drive to learn Torah, you have a drive to give tzedakah, it becomes easier. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu helps you. He helps you find the jacket that you want, He helps you find the dress that you want, the shoes that you want, whatever, anything that you want. He helps you find the chavruta. So that's also the thing, that the more a person wants to do what Hashem says, the more HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to help him. So when it comes to modesty for, uh, for women, always remember that you have to cover yourself, you can't look like a man, you can't wear pants, uh, you can't uh, show uh, parts of your body, uh, you have to look like a princess all the time, in so many words. Which is, I don't think it's so bad. I don't think it necessarily says a bad thing. I think it's a perfectly a good thing for a princess to look like a princess. Uh, but uh, for, for the guys, it's, uh, there's a little more room. Uh, especially since guys typically work with their hands. Sometimes they work on a, I don't know, a, a piece of land or with cars or all types of automobiles and so on. So sometimes uh, the uh, person wants to or needs to wear a shorter sleeve or something like that. That's fine. But again, know when to wear it and when not to wear it. Don't show up to learn Torah with a uh, short uh, shorts and a t-shirt. It's not appropriate. Uh, but even more so, it's a, uh, I think that the, uh, the biggest thing that we learned today is that it's not necessarily just the, uh, the clothing as far as, it's, but it's also what's the meaning behind it. Meaning, if you're going to wear this particular clothes because God said so, two thumbs up. But if you're wearing that clothes because Kanye said so, because, because uh, 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 you know, Lil Wayne said so, because Prada said so, because Versace said so, then I'm sorry, the whole shoe, or you have to watch it all over again. Watch the whole shoe, and just remind yourself of how much danger you're in. Because if you're wearing that, because some fashion designer said so, you have a very serious problem. So that's important. It's okay to look good, but it has to be kosher good. And technically, you could do a lot of things. There's a lot more things that are allowed than things that are forbidden, even though it seems like everything is forbidden. It's really not true. When you really calculate how much is forbidden versus how much is allowed, there's a lot more that's allowed. It's just that the forbidden has become so acceptable among society today that most people don't even know it's forbidden. Like until... Some of us read what the Shulchan Aruch says, what the, uh, uh, the Chinuch says, what they said about even pretending not to be Jewish. Who thought of this, Bechlal? How could you even get to this with human logic? That if I pretend to be Jewish, even as a joke, it's idol worship. Like, who would have thought that my joke, when I was 15 years old or something, you know, was, uh, was idol worship? Like, who, who would have thought of that? No, I was just kidding. Okay, you were just kidding. Now you have to, you know, bring a korban. You have to do tshuva, you have to fast, you have to do a lot of stuff. You, you, you worship an idol. That's a big deal. So, does the average Jew think of himself as an idol worshiper? No. Does the average fan of Manus Friedman and Y.Y. Jacobson think of themselves as an idol worshiper? No. No. They think of themselves as from Jews, good Jews, and, and, and whatever they are. But, Allah says otherwise. So, that's the thing. Is we have to be aware. Aware of where we stand. And again, the more we want to, the more HaKadosh Baruch is going to help us. So I think that when it comes to uh, the clothing, the priority should be, number one, who is motivating me to do this? It should always be Hashem and not a person of some kind, not some uh, persona. And two, modesty. Those are the two major things that should define every single outfit you have. Every outfit that you have. And it's a, uh, also a good idea to have special clothes that you only wear on Shabbat and holidays. Special shoes, special dress, special hat, whatever it is special. The more special you have for Shabbat and holidays, the better. Wear your best clothes only on Shabbat, only on, uh, on holidays. And the more glamorous, the more beautiful, the more Hashem is going to give you. Why? He pays for those things. You know, sometimes people think, oh, but if, uh, you know, religious people, you know, that means we have to, like, wear, like, uh, uh, ugly things. No, you could look absolutely beautiful, magnificent, princess, and, and king. 
but it has to be modest. Simple. You know, that's, it's, that, that's all it is. It's not, it's not uh, such a difficult thing. If you really want to have some like guidance, look at pictures from like a hundred years ago. Anything that was practically standard a hundred years ago, that's really what you're supposed to look like today. That's the, that's, that's, in essence, that's the, the fashion of today is, you know, don't look at it at all. And, and that's, that's the thing, let's take that into account and I think that uh, it's, it's not so difficult after that. Next question. Yes? As a Noahide, maybe Noahide if you will, yeah. but anyway, when we approach a lot of Jewish people, yeah. they often want to consider us missionaries. Hmm. And it is so difficult. Is there a place where it would be smarter for us to go? And how would we deal with all of this when all we want to know is more about Hashem and the Torah? Right. So that's, that's the, the, the difficult life of a Noahide is that there's no sense of community. Uh, Any times I've seen somebody try to organize a community of some kind, typically there was an agenda behind it. Uh, either there was like an enormous amount of uh, money or sometimes there was the uh, wrong message where they're telling the Noahides to pray to a rabbi instead of pray to God. So almost taking them from one idolatry to a different idolatry. So it's a very difficult, very difficult to be a, a Noahide uh, because there is no sense of community. Uh, and quite frankly, I think that a person has to make their own, meaning that they have to uh, do whatever they can as far as learn as much Musar and, and, and things that are applicable to them in their life and perfecting themselves. And just realize that they're not going to have the you know, big community around them at this point uh, because there's a lot of Noahides, but they're spread everywhere, all over the world. And it's if you could find you know, one friend, one couple that, that you could like connect to, you're already very, very wealthy. You know, and, and it's the same thing for a Jew too. Even if a Jew is living among a huge keilah, the more religious a Jew is, the less time he has for the socializing and for the network and so on. And typically there's one friend. Typically there's one friend. Why? Because number one, friends require time. And the more religious a person is, the more they learn Torah, the more they observe the, the mitzvot, the less time they have for this. Because they're busy serving God, they're busy earning their merit in this world. So the little time that they have, they're with their family, they're with their kids, they're with their spouse. And if they have time for any friendship, it's usually, you know, one friendship. And usually people that socialize a lot, where they have a lot of friends, it usually comes with a lot of baggage too. Uh, you know, a lot of problems and so on. So my, my, my suggestion is to eliminate the thought of a community. Even if you're Jewish, eliminate the thought of being part of like a huge organization, a huge, you know, everybody's best friends. Like, forget that. You know, try to get yourself one friend. Try to get yourself one friend that's like-minded, that's similar ideology. And that's it. Settle with that. If, I don't know, if Hashem really wants to bless you, wants to give you two, you're already very, very uh, wealthy. I mean, talk to any old man. Talk to any old woman. Ask him, how many friends do you really have? If they, say, if they say one, it's already like, wow. It's already wow. Why? Because it's hard. It's hard to be a friend. It's hard to have friends. People let you down. People change. People die. People move. You know, it's just people get busy. So it's, it's a, forget this whole concept of like camaraderie and a lot of people, you know, the, 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 the camaraderie that we have here is not because we're all friends with each other. It's not because we all like each other. It's that we all have the same goal. We all have the same goal. Now, Outside of this goal, we may all have different hobbies, different likes, different wants, different this, but we all have the same goal. We all want to go to heaven. We all want to serve God to the best of our ability. We all want to know the truth. So you have to find somebody with that similar ideology and see if they have some of the other things in similarity as well. Uh, but typically, it's, it, it's not going to be many people just because, again, the world is... Uh, you know, it, it's full of mixed opinions and it's very hard to maintain so many relationships. So I think that if a person has the right expectation, it eliminates a lot of letdowns and disappointments. Uh, it, uh, that's number one. And two, it also puts the person in, in, you know, in, in a, you know, they're looking for the right thing. You know, you can go to a store, but if you're, you know, if you're looking for clothes in a tool store, 
you know, it's, you're wasting your time. So as long as if you're, if you're looking for the right thing, then I think you have more of a chance of finding it. Uh, but as far as to, uh, to go to, let's say, a community of Jewish people and want to, let's say, blend in to that Jewish community, I think that the only uh, type of community uh, that would accept Noahides in there is either one, people that are very, very modern, which pretty much, you know, they're, they're the people that we talked about for the last two hours, okay, that, that are so modern that, you know, they don't really see much of a difference between them and the non-Jews. So you're not going to get along with them because you have a stronger ideology than they do, but they'll accept you. Or people that are like us, where it's a, we're looking, we're all looking for the same thing, we're all looking to serve Hashem at the best of our ability, and, uh, you know, you're, you have a mix of people that are already Jewish, people that are converting to Judaism, and people that are just doing their best, maybe become Jewish, maybe be, be a, a Noahide, but have enough in common that uh, you could be uh, around it. But again, communities like this are very rare. You'll find them here and there, small things, but uh, I know there's one, and uh, a friend of mine uh, that I met recently, uh, uh, he has like a, a thing going in South America. He says that like 95% of his, of his keila is converts. 95, but like literally, like the, almost all of them are converts. Uh, so for them, if, if let's say a Noahide comes and visits and so on, it's not a big deal to them. Why? Because they remember who they used to be. You know, they, they remember that, so it's not, it's not so foreign to them. But if you go to, let's say, a uh, Hasidic community, and, you know, they say, well, what's to you? Why are you here? They won't understand why you're there, because, again, they, uh, they don't have any connection to it. So you have to go and uh, either try to uh, uh, do a lot of Kiruv in modern uh, uh, communities. Uh, that's option one. Option two, find something similar to what we were trying to build here. But as Hashem, we will actually have a place that you know we can meet more regularly, uh, and uh, that's 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 option two. Uh, option three is, I guess, uh, try to uh, do a kind of a mix, a mix of uh, uh, of, of the two. But uh, it's it's not uh, it's not easy. But I also don't think that uh, it's that necessary uh, to have uh, uh, you know a lot of people and a lot of friends because. The more you want to serve Hashem, the less time you have for, for people. You know, and uh, it's, it's, that's, that's the, you know, for me, from my perspective, I honestly don't know how people have friends. I don't know how, I mean, I have a, different, a little bit of a different life than most people, but I don't understand how people have like time for three, four, five friends. But even before I became a rabbi, when I was a businessman, I, I, I didn't have time for friends. You know, once in a blue moon, you go and you have a drink, you go to a restaurant, but friends, like, you know, call you every day or something, or call you a few times a week. I don't even call, you know, family that often. Well, I, it's not that I don't like them. I love them. I care about them. I just don't have time. Now, if you need help, you can call me at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'll come and I'll help you. But to go ask you what's up, uh, ask you how you're doing, I don't know how people have time for that. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. And, and quite frankly, unless you have a problem, I'm not really interested. But that's my personality. Some people need it. Some people need, you know, the camaraderie and then they, the socializing and they want somebody to give them a high five every time they do, a, I don't know, a sneeze. They need that. That's fine. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, I think that the less, the less you expect, the easier it is to attain it. The more you expect, if you're like expecting like something like, you know, a big group of people and we're all like doing the same thing, it becomes impossible because so many people try to establish it, but there's always like, you know, somebody that has like some type of agenda that ruins it. You know, they try to make money out of everybody or they try to turn themselves into the leader of the tribe and everybody is like a follower of this, some cult. You know, and, and, and they try to do a lot of things with these things, so it's very difficult. Uh, and since there's no obligation to be part of any of it, it's, they break up very quickly. So you could literally move to the end of the world to be part of some Noahide uh, uh, community, but end up leaving it, you know, three weeks later because it broke up because, you know, two people got into a fight. So that's the thing. So I think it's a uh, 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 primary concern should be for you to spend as much time as you can to do the will of Hashem. That should be priority number one. Uh, if there is time, try to find somebody that is like-minded. Um, and I think uh, more times than not, it's those like-minded people are going to be people that are already close to you. 
you know, a family, uh, you know, a uh, friend that you already have, uh, and uh, it's just that maybe perhaps they didn't have the same beliefs as you until now, or maybe they did, but uh, usually uh, to find that person is, uh, is not something that you have to go that far for. Uh, but that's it. I, you know, it's, uh, uh, I know that people want more, but uh, I, I don't know how they do it. I, I can appreciate it. I can appreciate the way things look. You know, I see, it seems like some places have you know, a lot of camaraderie and unity and so on, but I've been around for long enough to know that most of that's fake. You know, like the picture is everybody smiling. Five seconds after the picture or five seconds before the picture, it wasn't exactly that. So that's, that's also another thing. Like the, uh, a lot of times when you see like these pictures and it looks like everybody, you know, was together and was happy and it's not always that. It's not, it's not usually like that before and after the picture. So try to, uh, you know, look at the world from, you know, before and after the picture, not the picture. Don't, don't look for the picture. Because most of the time the pictures that you see in the world is fake. Uh, and that's it. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's impossible to find somebody. I think there's plenty of people that are like-minded. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it's, sometimes it's, uh, you'll have to settle for a long distance. Meaning that you'll have your best friend, but they'll be in a different country. Now, if I could ever call anybody my friend, I have one friend. You know, aside from my wife, that's been my lifelong friend for 20 years already, Baruch Hashem. But she's my wife, so she's my everything, and that's a little bit different definition than everything else, but she's also my best friend. But aside from that, somebody that's outside of my marriage, if I could call anybody my friend, I only have one friend. And that's my, uh, my Rav, Rav, Rav Ephraim. Because we also talk about things that are friendly, that, uh, that are between us. But I don't think uh, that type of relationship is uh, easy to get. You know, the, a lot of investment went into that uh, and a lot of things that most people are not willing to do and most people are simply don't see alike and uh, um, so I think to develop something like that, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, but again, it's not a pure friendship. It's not a pure friendship because if he tells me something to do, then it, the friendship goes in the garbage. You know, now... I could agree, I could disagree, I could, uh, you know, cry my way through the bathroom. It not make a difference, I still have to do it. Why? Because he's rabbi first and everything else second. You know, so, so that's, that's the thing. So it's not pure friendship per se. But, uh, you know, as far as to get a lot of that, to get a bunch of people like that, I don't think it's possible. I wish it was, uh, you know, but I, I honestly don't know if, if, it's, if it's good for a person to have so many friends. Well, the learning part is the hardest part because we don't speak Hebrew and a lot of it we don't understand when we're going through, the, through any of the books. Mm -hmm. So it makes it difficult because when you go to a lot of Jewish people, they, they just have this fear. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... Monsters. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 listen, there's, there's enough of a... They have a lot of reasons to be afraid. Because there's so much missionizing happening today. To be honest with you, I'm surprised you're finding a lot of people that are afraid. Most people are uh, primary targets for missionaries because they're so vulnerable. So I'm surprised that you found so many people that are afraid of it. It's actually good uh, that they're afraid. But um, I think that uh, learning for, for, for you uh, and, and, and really for, for all Noahides... I don't think people should really expect it from uh, um, to have like a uh, place to go to uh, as the priority. I think that the main learning that people should get, especially from uh, the Nahid world, is from lectures and books. Lectures that you can watch online and books. In fact, even Rashi, Rashi 900 years ago, uh, apparently somebody asked him about friends and he said, he wrote, uh, if you want friends, get more books. Get more books of the sages. Each one becomes your friend when you read his book. Why? Because the more you read about what one of the sages said, the more you connect to him. The more you connect to him. I have a family that uh, they have a few kids, and they're uh, six-year-old and five-year-old, and I think maybe even, maybe even their, their younger one too, cried for two hours. Cried for two hours after they heard that Rav Kanievsky died. A six-year-old and a five-year-old cried for two hours because Rav Kanievsky died. Now, 
Did they ever meet Rav Kanievsky in real life? No. Did they even live in Bnei Block? No. Did they live anywhere near Bnei Block? No. Did they ever speak to him? No. You know what they know about Rav Kanievsky? He was a tzaddik and they saw him in the books. They saw him in the books and they, read, they heard his stories from their parents. So when they heard that Rav Kanievsky died, they cried for two hours. Now let me ask you guys a question. You don't have to answer it. How many of people here cried for two hours when they heard that the Gdullah Do died? So, you understand? They were better friends with Rav Kanievsky than, than, than the one that didn't cry. Even without meeting him in real life. So, the more you connect to the words of the sages in the books, the more you hear kosher lectures, the easier everything becomes because you start realizing that there's so much to do, uh, there's no time for a lot of the stuff that uh, people do. Uh, there's no time for it and I think that uh, if you use your time wisely, you'll, uh, you'll see that there is uh, really very little need or and even time to do a lot of the stuff that bother people typically. Uh, but uh, I think the main place that the main blessing that Hashem gave both the Jewish world and the Noahide world in this generation is access to, uh, to, uh, to Torah. There's an endless amount of Torah accessible to virtually anyone, uh, either via internet or easy via access of books. In the old generation, you know, to even get a book, sometimes you would have to travel six months just to go read a book, you know, that somebody owned sit in this house for a few months until you finish the book and then leave. Like to have book collections that people can buy with just a few thousand dollars, only rich people had it. So today, your average person with a few dollars or a credit card can get themselves a library that's, uh, you know, enormous. Key is to read it, obviously, but the point is, is that it's, uh, there's a lot of stuff to learn. And you can read, you can read a lot, you can learn a lot, there's good lectures out there. Uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, a lot of information that could occupy your time. If you can find somebody that you could share, uh, you know, that you could uh, talk about these ideas with, uh, that you hear about in the lectures and in the books, uh, you know, that's great. But uh, that person may be online. That, may, that person may be in a different country. Which, again, th the reason why I even remembered uh, to tell you about, you know, if I had a friend is because my Rav, you know, it's been a relationship that we have virtually uh, on the phone and Skype for the last, I don't know, decade and a half. I've only seen him twice in my life, in real life. You know, so it's not like, uh, oh, I go visit him every few months and, you know, we get to hug it out and I've seen him in real life twice. Now, we talk every single day and, you know, he knows everything about me and I know a lot and all that stuff, but an actual, like, physical, you know, uh, being in, present in the same room, twice. Why? It's not necessary. Not necessary. So, uh, it's, it's, I know some people think it's necessary. I, I don't know. I guess maybe, some, uh, maybe I'm a little different, but I don't really think it's... I have some really good people that I'm connected to, I guide and so on. They're in the you know, middle of different countries in the world. They're in, uh, you know, in the UK, in uh, South America, in Australia, in England, in all different places, uh, Canada. Uh, I never met any of those people in real life. Most likely I won't meet most of them in real life. Uh, but they could change their entire life as a result of the shiurim and the guidance that they get without necessarily ever needing to see me and, you know, shake my hand. So I think you can get uh, closer to your goal of having, uh, li you know, like-minded people or a sense of community if perhaps you uh, widen your horizons as far as, you know, definition of a community. If your definition of a community starts to be a, like an online community, then I think you could have a much, you know, it's much easier to get some of those people that you may be looking for. But if you're looking for physical, like actual place, then we have to go back to the, you know, other options that I mentioned before. Yes? Um, is there a way to know if Elio and Abi comes in case visits to people in our generation? He does. He does. Uh, he, uh, I mean, first of all, he comes to every Brit Mila. Uh, but he also comes in, uh, diff to different people at different times. Uh, and usually the people that uh, get to see Eliyahu Navi 
uh, you know, they, uh, they get some type of message of some kind that uh, this was it. Meaning that uh, it's known that, you know, you know, certain people that saw Eliyahu Navi, everyone knows, oh, this guy, yeah, that's uh, Yaakov, he had a Gilu Eliyahu. This is how it was always known. This guy, you know, that you pretty much, he's defined by that Gilu Eliyahu that he had one time in his life over a period of, let's say, 80 years that he lived. He know, he's known, not by the books that he wrote, not by the lectures that he gave, not by the address that he lives in and the car that he owns. He knows he's the guy that had a Gilu Eliyahu. How does everybody know that he had a Gilu Eliyahu? How did he know he had a Gilu Eliyahu? It's not that Eliyahu Navi comes to him and goes, oh, nice to meet you, I'm Eliyahu Navi. That's not that. Sometimes Eliyahu Navi, most of the time Eliyahu Navi is disguised as something, but apparently something happens to make the person, uh, you know, certain that this was it. Uh, I'm sure it's not the same, uh, I don't think they get a text message or anything, but uh, you know, I'm sure it's something that uh, happens to make it uh, clear to the person that this was a Gilu Eliyahu. Uh, because again, remember, usually uh, uh, you know, the people that have a, uh, that type of experience are, you know, they're, they're, um, they're all there, they're not crazy people. So, you know, so a person that's you know, mentally competent and, uh, and uh, is not going to say something that's going to make them look crazy if it's not true, you know, so, uh, you know, but typically uh, the Gilu Eliyahu uh, is not, people don't say it often, but they had it, uh, which makes it easier to believe that somebody did if they do, they say they have it, if there's an exceptional reason of why such a thing happened and something happened, you know, usually Eliyahu Navi doesn't come to say hello, usually something happens. The, but, uh, but there are more people that say that they spoke to God uh, or they saw God uh, than there is people that say that they saw or spoke to Eliyahu Navi. Uh, and I can tell you without a uh, hesitation that all of the people, all of them, without an exception, that said that they saw God or spoke to God, they're all crazy. They're all crazy. Every single one of them with no exception whatsoever, every single one of them is crazy. Now, does that mean they're bad people? No. Doesn't mean that they're bad people. Sometimes they're only crazy about this one particular thing. And they're normal everywhere else. Uh, and some of those people come to me and they tell me, I spoke to God 25 years ago, 10 years ago. And uh, my answer to them is, don't tell anybody else. I'm, I'm not telling you you're a liar. I'm not telling you you're even crazy. I'm just telling you, I've seen a lot of crazy things. I've seen a lot of wild things. I can understand that certain things seem that way. I can explain to you what you saw, but uh, not explain, it doesn't make a difference. Don't tell anybody this. Why? Because it's not, if it's true, why is it anybody's business? If it's not true, then you're crazy. Why do you want to advertise that you're crazy? You know, so, so that's the thing. So, but in the it's Navi, it's less common. It's less common. Uh, and, uh, and I give you guys a little bit of a... Uh, uh, food for thought, many times people see, uh, let's just call it special people in their dreams. Not, you know, not everyone that you see in your dream is really who they are. Like if somebody saw, let's say, I don't know, a famous rabbi in their dream, it's not always that rabbi. Sometimes it's a demon that's just trying to torture you. Like if somebody says, oh, I saw Moshe Rabbeinu in my dream. Yeah, it's more likely that you saw a demon that likes to mess with you. Because you did something wrong and the demon got a permission to pretend like he's Moshe Rabbeinu just so you could look stupid. In front of your friends that you tell people that you saw Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, and so they're allowed to do that. The demons are allowed to do that if you do certain things to do it. So many times the people that you see in your dreams are not who they are. Uh, and again, some of the, sometimes it is true. Sometimes it is true, but always be concerned about what the message was. If there's no message and you just saw whoever you saw, you saw Eliyahu Navi in your dream, you saw Moshe Rabbeinu in your dream, you saw Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, you saw everybody, you saw me in your dream. No problem. No, no message, you can see whoever you want to see, doesn't make much of a difference. I still don't recommend tell people uh, because most people don't want to understand what to do with that information anyway. But if there is a message, no uh, uh, a rule of thumb. If that message is against the Torah, you saw a demon 100%.
And typically it's the demon that's the uh, wife of the Yetzara or, or one of her soldiers. If it's something that is not against the Torah, uh, they tell you to learn more Torah, they tell you to do more mitzvot, go you know, do something holy or whatever it is, then it could be, could be real. Uh, could be real. But, uh, uh, you know, I'd say uh, th- there are certain people in the world that uh, merited, even in this generation, merited to see Eliyahu and Avi, and in many cases, even more than once. And more than once, but uh, it's not common. It's not common. The person has to have some type of merit because Eliyahu and Avi is much more uh, zealous and uh, uh, let's just call it picky with, uh, with who he uh, chooses to disclose himself to. Uh, even Rav Anan that you know, put together this book, uh, Tana Deve Eliyahu. Okay, this this sefer, this is the teachings between Ravanan and uh, Eliyahu Navi. The first three quarters of the book is called Eliyahu Rabba. The last quarter of the book is called Eliyahu Zuta. Why? Because for the first three quarters it was uh, it was Eliyahu Navi learning with uh, with the uh, with the tzaddik and uh, normal. But then this tzaddik, it's in the times of the Gemara, he uh, accepted a gift, accepted a gift from somebody. And Eliyahu Navi didn't like it, that he accepted this gift. So he showed him himself as an angel. And Eliyahu Navi, looking like who he really is as an angel, was too scary for Rav Anan to, to bear. So they continued learning together, but he used to have to always, he, to, he made himself a box, and he would hide inside the box, and just hear what Eliyahu Navi was saying and write it down. Because it was too scary to be next to him. So you can just imagine. You just, you know, it's some food for thought of, of who you're dealing with. So, this same Eliyahu Navi, his best friend over here, <laughs> you have a whole book of Eliyahu Navi. A, he was scared of him. So, he's, he's very picky with who he comes to. And uh, if he came to you, that's a merit. That's a very, very big merit. If he did come to a person, it's a very big merit. We actually say in, uh, as part of Avdalah. And also in one of the songs in, uh, 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 on Yom Shishi, that uh, praiseworthy is the person that saw Eliyahu Navi and he said hello to him and Eliyahu Navi responded to him hello. That's a special meritorious person. That's a, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. If Eliyahu Navi said hello to you and you said hello back, that's a big deal. Now I can assure you that within the next 24 hours, at least 10 people are going to email me. Yeah, Rabbi, yeah, he said hello to me. And I said hello back. I said, what's up, man? I said, okay, buddy, okay. I said, okay, buddy. Well, every time I tell people these things, at least 5, 10 people tell me it happened to them. Okay, all right, it happened to you. Good for you. You know, like, they heard it for the first time in their life, but it happened to them, you know. (laughs) It happened to me. But again, if if you saw him, typically he wants you to know that you saw him. There's no point of, of Hashem sending you something like that without uh, you knowing that that's what it is. But usually there's a significance to it. And uh, Hashem. Interesting question. Yes? Speaking of dreams, is one allowed for the purpose of studying later on in life to draw, paint, sketch, and experience in an observance scene? What? what something, are you allowed to draw what you saw in a dream? Draw, sketch. Sure. As long as it's not something immodest or filthy, it's not idolatry of some kind, by all means, go, draw away. Yeah, so drawing is actually a good, uh, it's a good uh, thing to do if you could do it uh, for a living, if you have the skill. If you draw, you could draw a lot of good things. Uh, one of the uh, famous Ba'alei Tshuva, uh, there was an artist uh, actually uh, went to, I think it was Rav Steinemann, and asked him, what am I going to do with this skill? Uh, uh, you know, I'm an artist, but now that I'm about tshuva, he told him, why don't you take the Mishnah and draw something for each Mishnah? And they did it, and it became the most popular uh, set of Mishnayot in, uh, in Israel for, for till this day. Uh, so, um, and Gadi Palak is also another artist that's about tshuva that took his art and uh, made, a, made not only a profession out of it, but he's the most sought-after artist uh, in the Jewish world. Uh, he's unbelievably uh, uh, talented and unbelievably impossible to reach. Like, they hide him, practically. Literally, they hide him. You can't reach him directly. It's not, it's not like you could 
reaches students maybe somewhere, but to reach them directly, it's uh, maybe an easier chance to reach Eliyahu Navi. Uh, <laughs> so that's the. So you can use uh, that. It's a very good thing to do. Um, and if you have kids that are talented with art, then uh, I would recommend that you uh, allow them to develop that art. But always, always remind them that you know the what's allowed, what's not allowed. Same thing with music, same thing with things like that. Always remind the kids what's allowed, what's not allowed already when they're little. Because if you, let's say for example, if your uh, uh, daughter likes to sing, I recommend not developing that art. Why? Because in the Jewish world, there's not much that she can do with it. There's not much she can do with this Jewish, with the woman singing. And yes, I know there's a few women that sing just to women, but it's very, very problematic in the Jewish world. Uh, but if she's an artist, then she can use that art for a lot of kosher things. So always be the, uh, the smart one that sees what could eventually happen out of the talents that you or your kids have. Um, and what to develop. Uh, I don't know, for whatever reason or another, many parents like to send their kids to like dancing classes, like ballet. If you're trying to, uh, uh, you know, serve Hashem, that ballet, that dancing class, canceled tomorrow. Why? There's nothing good they can do out of it. Who are they going to dance for? Who exactly are they going to dance for? Other than something that's forbidden. There's really no reason. And a lot of times, what ends up happening is that women that are allowed, you know, as kids to develop these skills of singing, of dancing, uh, you know, they, they end up, unfortunately, falling into that world. Uh, I also tell guys, guys, uh, is apparently there's this disease in this generation, every, uh, everybody uh, likes to rap because they, I don't know, they know how to rhyme things, you know, so they figured that if I could rhyme a few words, if I could say hat and cat and tack and pack and tack, and that means I should be the next, uh, you know, guy on, on BET, uh, then, uh, you know, everybody thinks they're the next Jewish rapper, uh, and they're going to call themselves Skittles, and, uh, and maybe they're going to have a career like Eminem. Now, this is a talent you should throw in the garbage. This is a talent you should throw in the garbage. Why? Most of the time, you can't really develop it to anything useful, uh, and even if you could, it's better you don't. Why? Because the test of celebrity is almost impossible for anybody to pass. Like, just look at some of the people that have succeeded in the so-called music world. Even if they started the right way, many times they fell off. Many times they fell off. Why? This, the test of celebrity, I mean, you need like a specially fine-tuned neshama to withstand it. Because even though you could be from, you could be from, you could have a beard from here to the end of the room. At the end of that performance, there's at least three or four zonot that are willing to throw themselves at you. Yeah, but he's from and he's married and he's a... Make a difference. How many guys are going to say no? Not many. Not many. So it's, it's that. It's money test. It's the notoriety. It's ego. It's a lot of things. So talents like that, like rapping and singing and stuff like that, it's better not to develop it. Uh, I mean, unless you want to be a chazan, but I don't know if there's necessarily enough uh, work to go around for everybody to be a chazan, but you could definitely uh, do that. Uh, but again, usually most people have more than one skill. Most people have more than one skill, and uh, you should see where, where is the least amount of risk. Don't choose uh, the skill that has the most potential as far as money. Don't choose the profession that has the most amount of money. Choose the profession or the skill that has the, you know, it's the most kosher. Because the money is not decided by the skill. The money is decided by Hashem. How much money you make doesn't really make much of a difference if you're, uh, if you're a singer or you're an athlete or you're selling Q-tips to hotel chains. Doesn't make a difference. And I can tell you from experience, I've dealt with a lot of millionaires and billionaires in my life. And uh, people are very often mistaken of what they think success is. Many people, you know, in, in, in my generation, and I still think some people in this generation, many people wanted to marry uh, or become doctors and lawyers. Today, very few people want to be doctors and lawyers because there's a lot more money to be made being an entrepreneur uh, of, of a million kinds. Uh, the, today, you could be an entrepreneur with, with uh, still being with your sweatpants, t-shirt, and a YouTube camera. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can do in the world today. Uh, so, the best thing to do is to 
uh, use the talent or go towards the profession that is the most kosher. Because the success uh, that you have is decreed by heaven, which means that whether you choose the kosher profession or the non-kosher profession, you're going to make the same amount of money. Now, theoretically, it seems like, wait a minute, if I'm going to become some gangster rapper versus I'm going to become a plumber, surely I'm, if I hit it, if my rhymes uh, you know, are, are, are like busters, and, and versus if I just bust another pipe, surely I'm going to make more, my, more money you know, uh, being, being, uh, you know, being a rapper. Right? Wrong. Wrong. Why? HaKadosh Baruch decides how much money you're going to make. Which means, if you were destined to make, if HaKadosh Baruch decides for you to make $10 million, you'll make $10 million being Busta Rhymes, or you'll make $10 million being a plumber. How? HaKadosh Baruch runs the world. This is what we just went over. This is what the Alakha means, that Hashem runs everything, before, during, after. He's in control of everything. All the splendor to Him. All the glory to Him. Oh, everything, him, 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 him. We, zero, nothing. What, does that mean I'm not important, Rabbi? No, it doesn't mean that you're not important. You're important, you're just insignificant, which are two different things. Your success, him. Your effort, you. Success, him. Effort, you. So don't choose the profession or the skill set that it looks like this is going to be the one that makes the most. Don't choose it that way. Whatever you're supposed to make, you're going to make. Same goes with learning. Same goes with learning, where don't think that if you learn four hours a day versus two hours a day, that means that uh, you know, you'll make less money. Wrong. Wrong. You're not going to make less money because you learn more Torah. Whatever you're going to make, you're going to make, even if you work an hour. Whatever you're supposed to make, you're going to make. Now again, to work an hour and learn the rest of the day takes a very strong level of emunah. But what you're going to make is not going to change. And this brings me to something that I have no idea how I got to this, but still it's good to, to, to say, because it's connected to it, which is also for, for, uh, for problems. People think that if, let's say, I get help, if, uh, if, 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 if let's say, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know, she just got a baby and she has a husband help her and she figured okay he's helping me uh, because uh, but he's not learning Torah and as a result of, of him helping me I'm able to handle this new baby or uh, you know if, as a result of, uh, of having uh, you know uh, three babysitters then it's easier for me to manage my kids uh, wrong wrong why the amount of problems that you have is already determined also whether you have two kids 14 kids. The quantity of problems is exactly the same. You have to decide whether you want Hashem to, to divide up the, the problems over 14 kids or two kids. Some people don't want to have more kids because they think it's more problems and they can't afford them. Wrong. How much problems you're going to have, how much difficulty you're going to have is going to be exactly the same. What Hashem decides on Rosh Hashanah you have, let's say, 100 pounds of difficulty. So that means if you have two kids or 10 kids, it's the same 100 pounds divided into two different things. Now typically, two kids with 100 pounds of problems is much more difficult than 10 kids with 100 pounds of problems. Because 10 kids with 100 pounds of problems usually they just don't do their homework. Two kids with 100 pounds of problems, usually one of them is a murderer or something. You know, so it's like, so you'd rather have, you know, the problems spread out. Same thing with, if you send your husband to go learn Torah versus him helping you, that's not going to improve your life. To, to, to keep him helping you babysit the baby versus him learning Torah. It's not going to make it. Because if you send him to go learn Torah, suddenly you're going to have more strength and more ability and more siyat adishmaya to manage that baby. Now when he's next to you, it seems like you couldn't do it without him. You're right, because when he's next to you, instead of learning Torah, you couldn't do it without him. But if you send him to learn Torah, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends an angel to help you instead. So now, all of a sudden, you have the strength to do it by yourself. When you made your husband get a second job because you wanted three cleaning ladies, it seems like you couldn't do it without them. Three cleaning ladies, I need them. But then you told your husband, you know what, husband? Instead of three cleaning ladies, let's just have one. And the other salaries for the two other cleaning ladies, let's give it towards Kiruv. Let's give it towards Toa. That seems like you couldn't do it. One cleaning lady instead of three cleaning ladies, seems like you couldn't do it. 
But because of the merit of what you're doing, all of a sudden, one clean lady is almost too much. You tell her to come once a week instead of every day. Why? Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu did it. Sometimes it goes, it, it's, you have to understand, the problems do not change as far as the quantity. It's how you get it, how you get it. And that's, that's, that's one of the most difficult things to, to, uh, to grasp because you have to see it to believe it almost. You have to see it to believe it, but it's it's very important for a person to know that their talent, their skills, their uh, you know the, the, these are all gifts from Hashem, and Hashem is going to give you the ability to use everything you have for good or for bad. You have to choose wisely, and that's what you get judged on. That's what you get judged on. Next, okay, Rabotai, Tiskul Mitzvot Rabot. We're gonna go uh, for anybody that has uh, wants a blessing or has personal issue or question or anything like that i'll be over here for as long as you guys want me to thank you very much for everybody to come and bezot hashem we'll uh, see you guys uh very soon what about the raffle? The? The raffle. oh yeah the raffle the raffle yes oh so oh the raffle actually the raffle is a uh, different from the last couple of times i always forget this raffle i think we should get like a raffle portion uh too many jobs that i have so the raffle actually today is different Last couple of times we gave a set of the Rav Nisim Yagen books. This time I got you something special all the way from Eretz Yisrael. It's these uh, two uh, uh, Kiddush cups that have the, uh, uh, the blessing and the kavanot of the Rashash. Rashash is one of the Jewish sages that a person that uh, uh, uses these uh, cups, it has a, sp a special zgula if you also add to it a uh, certain blessing or, or, or a certain, uh, you read the letters that are on the cup, at the end of Avdalah, it brings a lot of mercy from heaven on a person and blessing and parnasah and a lot of really good things. Long story short, the person that wins gets two of these cups. They're, uh, I don't know, like $150 each. Uh, so you'll get uh, two of them. Uh, you can use them for uh, Pesach, you can use them for Shabbat, you can use them for display, whatever you want to do. Okay, how about Yes. You want to do the thing? Or? You want to do it? Uh, I don't know. Thank you. It's going to be sweet. Thank you. That's good. No, 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 no. So, this is what happened to me last time. They keep falling off. So, people are going to. I wonder if it's the same cards keep coming on. How do you do this? Here we go. Okay, okay let's go. Okay, there you go. Okay. Zero, 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 zero. Nine three. Winner. <laughs> All right, school meets for the board. Thank you everybody for coming. We'll see you guys uh, after Pesach. Baruch Adonai Lolam. Amen ve Amen.
מברך, אני מברך את הרבנים, רגע, 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 אני מברך את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שהלכו לפי העליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל מה שיפנו, ישכילו ויצליחו, יזכו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולם מה שטוב. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה, איפה זה פלורידה? אמריקה. כן, לי